Welcome to Your Hair Big Girl's Attack on Titan podcast. I'm Mom Taku. By way of reminder, Luna is focusing on the anime, so I'll be covering our Chapter 136 discussion without her. I've, I've probably mentioned this before, but um, many times when we have new guests on the podcast, they're people that we've never met. There have been times I haven't known what nation they're from, what pronoun they use, what their conversation style is, which is probably not a great way to run the podcast, but it makes for good conversation and it's worked for us. I mentioned that because this month I have two new guests, but it's the opposite. These are people that I know extremely well. Both are longtime fans of the series and also longtime friends of mine. And I, I'm not sure how well you guys are known among the YouTube audience, but I know for sure on Tumblr and Twitter, and especially in, in my community, you guys are both absolute rock stars. So it's with a lot of excitement that I welcome, first of all, longtime fandom writer and Tumblr blogger, my friend Lost Causes No Regrets. Welcome. Thanks. It's great to be here. And I called you a rock star and not a beloved dinosaur, so I get points for that. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thank you mm. so much. <laughs> My second guest is the wildly talented, and if you follow her on Twitter, you'll know that she's wickedly funny as well, the artist who goes by Sirius C, but is better known as Marie. Marie, I know that this podcast is not your comfort zone, but thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. We always kick things off with chapter impressions. So I think it's a good way to kind of get a general feel of what you thought about the chapter and also for the listening audience to get an idea of your voices. Lost, we'll start with you. What did you think about 136? Devote your hearts. Well, it was always going to be a good chapter with that title, really. And I certainly really enjoyed it. I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. I have to confess that I'm not usually a huge fan of chapters that involve a lot of action. But one of the things that I really enjoyed about this chapter was it felt that there was like a really good balance between the action scenes and all the different groups got a bit of airtime. And I think sometimes that's something that maybe Asayama struggles with a bit. You can be left waiting for weeks on end or months on end rather to find out what's happening to your particularly favourite group of people, but I thought there was a really nice balance, this chapter of the action, and we got a little bit of information about what almost all the discrete groups were doing. The only people who were really missing were Eren himself and Historia. And I think I I was even really glad to see Zeke at the end, which I'm sure you'll be very surprised to hear. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, I have to say I really enjoyed this chapter, really enjoyed it. And what about you, Marie? Yeah, I really liked it as well. Um, It really has that feeling of everyone coming together to the main scene now. And you definitely get the feel that some big stuff is going to happen. I really, really like that. I really like Peak and Levi as usual. Um, But also this time, all the Titan pages, uh, I loved a lot more than usual. I thought they were extremely well done. And for me, I also, I think... um... You know, this chapter for me was like an eight out of 10 or, or, or somewhere close to that. My only criticism, and it's not a criticism even of this chapter, it's just that it took so long to get here. And this is yet another setup chapter. Now, granted, I think the last two together have been fantastic setup chapters. I just wish they'd happened sooner. And like knowing that there's three chapters remaining makes me uncomfortable that we're still setting up. But of course, now that the story is moving to paths, things can happen a lot faster. Yeah, I think that's that's a very valid criticism. And I think it's, I can understand getting a little bit antsy knowing that there are only three chapters left and things are still coming together. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can move forward now. Looking back over some of the previous narrative decisions, I just, I can't help but think, were they necessary? And I think that that's something that we talked about privately. The chapter kicks off with the fate of the boat crew, which there's no surprise that we're seeing Yelena and Kiyomi. I think in our last podcast, we predicted that they would be in the opening pages. But that whole side quest has to have resolution. Yeah, and it's not really sure what they're up against now. I mean, they're just left in the open sea, it seems. And I don't have a lot of hope. As for the fate of the ship itself, it's like everyone is kind of thinking they left them and sacrificed themselves in a way. So I don't know if we should expect to see them again. Yeah, my my feeling about that was 
I think everyone predicted what was going to happen, which did make it seem a bit unnecessary to send Gabby and Falco and Annie away on the ship just to effectively bring them right back immediately. I don't think that really added anything. I do think that Kiyomi will survive. I actually think Yelena might as well. But yeah, the whole sending these characters away just to bring them back did seem a touch unnecessary to me. It did add some humor, though. And I think we touched on that last month. Like, Annie had one job. She was supposed to watch the kids. And of course, Reiner's expression when they came back, that poor man, all he's wanted to do was protect these children. And here they are in the thick of the battle yet again. Which brings us to the second thing that happened was that reminder of what chapter was it? I'm thinking it was chapter 93. This, this chapter has a callback to that conversation between Reiner and Falco from chapter 93, which I did not see coming. That promise that together they would protect Gabby. Yeah, I really thought that it's been insisted on so much in so many chapters and repeatedly that I definitely get the feeling that it's not going to happen. It's It, it can't work out smoothly. Like You cannot insist uh, that the kids have to be protected so much and not have it play a big part later. So I guess it was always distinct fail. Yeah, I, I kind of think it's been set up to fail a bit. And I, I must admit, I'd actually forgotten about that detail until it came up in the anime, uh, because obviously the anime sort of covered that quite recently. And uh, yeah, I tend to agree with Marie. I think it wouldn't surprise me if we see Falco making the noble sacrifice to save Gabby, to be honest. I have them on my list of people who live. So I, <laughs> I would hope that's not the case. But we did ask in the poll specifically about this because it did seem like um, that's a long time to leave a promise sitting. And at this point, like 40% of people think it's, it's not going to mean anything. One of the options on the poll was, it's setting up some dark twist where fake Will Falco fails to protect her. And when I saw that option, I just shuddered because, of course, that's what it's setting up. I don't want it to be setting mm, that up. But um, that was only 16% of the vote. And of course, 30% are with you lost that he'll sacrifice himself, perhaps in some big moment. Well, Isayama doesn't include anything in this story without reason. So there's a good reason why Reiner brought that promise up again. So it, as Marie said, it, it has to be trailing something. Yeah, you don't bring it up after 40 chapters if you don't intend. Or how many? 93. I'm terrible at math. This is 39. That many, was made in 93. Chapters. That's a long many, time many. Ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My hopes for the... Gabby Falco happy ending are maybe a little bit less hopeful, but yeah, a bit optimistic. Mm, wrong manga. They might survive, but definitely they're not going to do so unharmed at this point, I guess. Maybe that's it. Maybe he's just planning for like some epic, almost bad thing to happen. Yeah, we and we we've got a lot of those recently. We do, we do. Which actually takes us to Fort Salta. We're just blow past all these little <laughs> topics to get to Levi and Peak because <laughs> it's like my outline for this literally was stuff happens, Levi and Peak, the end. But okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So Fort Salta, yay. The MAGA 2.0 has a name, Secretary Muller. And I think this kind of is back to what you're saying, Marie. Like Isayama has cried wolf. A hundred too many times, and nobody is buying this setup at all. I think the vast majority of people think that this is going to end just fine. But what's more interesting to me is that most people are okay with it ending just fine. On the poll, we asked if the hostilities on Fort Salta are resolved peacefully, how would you feel? And only 17% of people would dislike it or hate it. More than 80% of people are either have no opinion or are really happy. That is Sayama's crying wolf yet again at, at the confrontation here. I would be very surprised if it did result in catastrophic hostilities. I could maybe see a, a one or two shots being fired, but I think there will be some kind of cautious resolution between the Marlians and the Eldians. Maybe not, you know, all out peace and big hugs all round, but I think they will agree 
to work together. And I think that does kind of shadow what the Alliance is doing. And I know we'll come on and talk about that later. Yeah, definitely. It does. It does evoke the feeling that uh, everyone is starting to unite before a greater threat and that the tensions that might have happened before don't mean anything much anymore. Not that there is death and destruction before them. So as Lost said, uh, echoing the dynamic of the, uh, the Alliance and everyone coming together, I could very much see the Eldians and Marleans coming together in their own way as well. I think the option I picked on the poll was that I felt like the setup was a bit contrived. This reminded me a little bit of, I don't know if you guys have seen the the Titanic movie from, I don't know if it was the 80s or the 90s, <laughs> but as the ship is sinking, they're running around firing guns at each other because of, you know, a love interest. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know what, guys, maybe you should be tearing a bookshelf off the wall and building a raft because you're going to die in about two minutes. What's the point of killing each other? But a lot of people, I think, feel like this is actually a very good move, that it's not all kumbaya at this point. They're still angry at each other. They still don't trust each other. That even though it may be the setup is a bit contrived, it's really good that we're seeing this. Yeah, no, I I think I would agree with that. I went back and looked because I remember Reiner's mom taking off her Marley armband. Do you guys remember everybody else removing theirs? No, I, I don't remember that. It's quite interesting the way that you can you can see the shadow in their clothes, though. Uh, he's drawn the shadow of the armband on their clothes, mm-hmm. so it's quite obvious that they have been removed, but I don't remember actually seeing them remove it. No, I thought from the, from the scene that we've seen in this chapter, we were supposed to discover with the characters that actually they've all removed their armbands. Yeah, I went back and I looked through some of the previous chapters to see when that moment was. And when they're on the train, none of them are wearing them. I think the the only holdout might have been Reiner's mom because she was very proud of hers. Hers was a different color than everybody else's. But um, there is a comment in line 33 where one of the guys, the one that looks like Armin, one of the train boys, tells Peak Finger's dad to throw his armband out the window. And I had completely missed that when I read chapter Mm. 133. Like it didn't seem significant, but it's very consistent throughout that they've not been wearing their Mm armbands since they got on the train. I missed it as well. One of our former podcast guests, King's Grave, wrote some meta that I thought was interesting. He said that the Eldians took off their armbands in this confrontation with the Marleans and the Marleans still don't trust them. What if this is supposed to be a parallel of them losing their ability to become Titans? They're no longer marked by the thing that identifies them as Eldians, but they're still not trusted because they're seen as Eldians and people won't forget their Eldians. So maybe Isayama has this scene and this standoff to specifically address that problem. If so, I think it's pretty subtle. I I mean, one thing I don't like in the story is when Isayama tells us like, you know, they have these like really ham-fisted conversations about, oh, we're going to get along now. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe this was like a real subtle thing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could be. Could be. I really have no thoughts about this <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not so sure I do either. Like, it's just like, okay, this is going to happen and it's mm-hmm. and it'll be okay. I mean, it, it ties in nicely with the overall theme. So, I mean, that's a nice move to have included. But yeah, I'm not sure I could guess a... I don't know, resolution or meta just based on that. Yeah, I I think it is something that has, you know, it's one of the main themes of the series is that there are, everyone suffers as a result of war on all sides. So people are culpable in different ways and for different reasons, but they're all still victims of war. You know, it could just be underlining that point again. I do think, you know, most people, though, do agree it's going to end. It's going to end just fine. And I think prevailing wisdom is that uh, it's Secretary Mueller firing into the I just love that we have a name for him now. Secretary (laughs) Mueller firing into the air. Well, I'm not sure it goes so far as to say it's going to end just fine. (laughs) But I I suspect they're not going to shoot each other right now. (laughs) That might be a bit optimistic. optimistic. Yes. (laughs) Especially, we should know better, but... (laughs) True, true, true. I yeah. I mean, relatively fine means not killing each other before they're stomped by titans. Yeah, I, I suppose you could say there will definitely be less death than expected, and that would be. 
or just at this moment. Yeah, as optimistic as I'm willing to get. Yeah. They're not going to die by gunfire. They're going to die by <laughs> Titan stomping. And they have a few more minutes, okay? <laughs> Another chapter at least. But I think this also means that we get one more speech from Secretary Mueller, which, ugh, okay. All right, those are those things in the chapter that I did not enjoy. Let's get on to the things that I did enjoy. First of all, the Alliance makes a plan. So criticism this chapter, and this is something I know, um, Lost, you and I have active inboxes on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Since chapter 108, Aaron's friends have been discussing, tossing about, maybe we're going to have to stop this guy. Maybe we're going to have to kill this guy. What is it now? We're at chapter 136. That's a very, very, very long time for them to be tossing this idea around and only now coming to the conclusion, I think. So Lost, you're a writer. So I wanted to ask you specifically about this. This constant repetition that Isayama does, does it need to be done so often? Uh, I would say no. And I have to say, I think sometimes... Isayama can be a bit as subtle as a sledgehammer with his writing sometimes. He just really hammers points home and you, you feel like saying, okay, we've got it, we understand. And I think particularly in this case, well, on the one hand, it's absolutely understandable that I think everyone is fully aware of the atrocity of Erin's actions. And they know that he has to be stopped. And I think in their heart of hearts, they know that probably the only way to do that is to kill him. I can absolutely understand their reticence about committing to that because, you know, they grew up together. They went through a lot of hardships together. Erin was, after all, the hope of humanity for a long, long time before he effectively betrayed that trust. So I can understand their reticence. But yeah, we got it. You don't need to keep hammering at home, especially this late in the day. And again, I think it does come down to the fact that a lot of us are getting a little bit antsy that there are only three chapters left and we don't want to be going over old ground, um, particularly, I think, if it's something that has come up just a couple of chapters previously. So, so yeah, I think, you know, we've got it now. Okay, we understand. We don't need to go over this again. <laughs> It's it's been repeated a lot, but there are only no beginning to maybe you want to do it. So honestly, if I didn't know those were the final chapters, I would have bet on I mean a few dozen more repetitions of that. <laughs> uh, but they seem condensed <gasps> enough for now, and I really hope they are because talking is really well, and I I wish they had done more of that. But maybe I guess the midst of the genocide isn't the time to do it anymore. It might be too late. And I think they've all come to realize that. Yeah, less talk, more action. And the pattern is always the same. It's Jean, Connie, or Armin, boo-hoo, we might have to kill Aaron. And then Mikasa, what do you think about that? Like every single time, it's just to kind of focus in on her hesitation. They're all having the hesitation. They're all having the exact same hesitation. None of them want to do this. And yet it's always Mikasa. We might have to kill Aaron. What do you think? But it does feel very much like this is leading up to a thing with Mikasa, which I'm very happy about. Ms. Mikasa needs many things. She needs a lot of focus. But, well, let me just pop over to the poll. We did ask in the poll about whether or not it took them too long to reach this point. First of all, how did you guys answer that? Oh, I can't remember. What were the options? <laughs> It took a reasonable amount of time because killing their friends is a big deal. Uh, yes, given the stakes, they should have recognized it a long time ago. And the third one was that only Mikasa took too long to make that decision. No, I, I chose the second option. Yeah, same, same. Because it it did take too long, but from a story standpoint, I suppose it took the time it had to take to develop everything else around mm -hmm. it. And... SNK would be a much shorter manga if Eren had been killed by mm, military police in volume one, but there has been talk <laughs> of killing Eren for as long as the story's been developing. So uh, I, I feel there is a part of the story that's basically Eren goes further down the worst possible path, and another one that goes recruit people who think Eren needs to be killed, and I suppose they finally met. We've always had 
talks of killing Eren since the first the first chapter almost of the manga and for now for wildly different reasons we have now arrived at the same mm -hmm. part at the same point but from his childhood friends that's that's an excellent point in their poll results 30 percent of the fandom selected the option about that only mikasa is taking too long to make that decision i mean Jean is the one that's crying here saying, Mikasa, we need to kill Aaron. Mm. They're struggling with it just as much as she is. And I feel like this chapter, the fact that they made the plan to kill Aaron, everybody's gone off to do it. Mikasa's not trying to stop them. Like, what do they want from her? Mm. I feel, yeah, I feel like they do want some resistance and they're always looking up to her uh, either to validate or go against. I suppose if she said something, either yes or no, they would listen to her in some capacity. But the fact that she's not saying anything, actually, mm. they do have to go through with it. Yeah, hmm. I, I agree. I think part of the problem is Mikasa isn't saying anything. She's not you know, there's a lot of focus on the expression on her face, but she's not actually saying anything one way or another. And I think that is what makes it quite problematic. Then again, Ackermans are pretty quiet about stuff. Although when it comes to talking <laughs> about their lieges, they're not. So, <laughs> But Mikas has been quiet about Erin for a long time by now. Yeah. Yes, she has. I mean, I'm looking at the panels now, and she does look a little bit betrayed at the death talk. I'm not sure she's surprised by it, though. I mean, she's just heartbroken. Yeah, I agree. I agree. One thing that a lot of people I've noticed have focused in on that on was Levi saying, there's a whole lot I wanted to tell that idiot, but damn it. Something I think that goes into my... Like I've got the win-lose column as far as things I predicted correctly versus incorrectly. One thing I really thought was that Levi would get one more chance to either flying kick Aaron or <laughs> express his disappointment with him. And this chapter kind of felt like maybe our expectations were being managed a little bit. They might not get that chance to talk. Uh, this could be just a red herring, but it may be possible that three chapters is not enough for everybody to get to tell Aaron. Just how exactly he failed? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Is this Isayama as a writer saying, don't get your hopes up for this happening? Or is it just a, a comment? I suspect it's a get out clause, actually. I think mm. maybe Levi won't have an opportunity to talk to Erin. And this is a very quick way to just get that out of the way. Certainly if I was right, that's what I would do if I didn't want to write that conversation. I could be wrong, of course. I think there is a lot that Levi certainly could say to him. But again, given the fact that there are only three chapters, I think we probably won't have a big heart to heart between Levi and Aaron. I think if anyone is going to talk to him, it's not going to be Levi. It's more likely to be Armin or Mikasa or Zeke um, or maybe even one of the other, uh, possibly even Reiner, who knows? Mm. This is probably a good time to introduce an ask that we got from Ruby Gus. She says, I'm excited for this episode and the Levi talk. Huge fan of you both. We got some great in insight into how Levi is feeling about Erwin and his promise, and we will get to that. But if there's time, what do you think Levi would want to tell Aaron? And I think that that's such a fun question. We even asked on the poll, like, if you could pick one person to talk to Aaron, who would you pick and what would they say? So let's focus in on, on Levi. Ruby Gus would like to know from you guys, what do you think Levi wanted to tell Aaron? Marie, why don't you take that first? I definitely understand the question because we have to think back to the fact that Levi was the first one tasked to kill Aaron if it got out of hand. And it got really, really, really out of hand. Especially since all that all they did, all that the survey corps did, all that they sacrificed was for their hope in Eren, which is now very ironic. I would suppose he could remind him of that, but again, I'm not certain Levi is, is in a place to care so much, as he said. So I really wonder how it would go if they were to talk. I wonder if you're not like at the point where um, maybe there's not anything left to be said. Like maybe maybe his actions, Aaron's actions, spoke louder than any words at this point. I wonder what you think. 
Yeah, I certainly agree with that. I think I think if Levi was to say anything to him, I think it would be very much along the lines of his internal monologue in chapter 112 in the forest just before Zeke legs it into the trees and transforms Levi's squad into titans. And you see Levi have this sort of, this really quite angry and despairing internal monologue about what a joke, that's that's the word he uses, it's, it's just a joke, a sick joke, I think is what he calls it. And he's thinking of the, the number of times they have laid, the Survey Corps have laid down their lives in order to save Eren and that he, they put all their hope in him and that just came to naught i think there was a there was a huge amount of anger and frustration in that monologue and i think if he was to speak to Aaron, i think some of that would potentially come out or maybe he would just kick him in the teeth again which kind of conveys the same meaning really i mean we've seen that a couple of times but yeah. another one could have heard yeah speaks yeah. louder than words yeah. He did say something to that effect. What was it in 131 when they were all in paths? And he said, you know, if you stop now, I won't. I forget what he said, something about kicking his ass yeah. again or too yeah. hard or, or something like that. So going back to the poll question then, since uh, we know that Armin and Mikasa will likely get that chance, aside from them, who would you want to talk to, Aaron, and what would you want them to say? Or what do you think they would say? I would quite like to see Reiner having an, a chance to talk to him again. I think I would like Reiner to have an opportunity to say to him, no, we aren't the same. Because mm. that conversation that they had in the basement in Liberio where, you know, Erin says, I realise now we're just the same. And I don't think they are because I think had it stopped there, then maybe I could have believed that. But after that... After the slaughter of Liberio, Erin then made the decision to go on and effectively launch whole scale genocide to try to kill the entirety of humanity. And that, you know, I don't really want to get into sort of moral relativism here, but that I think is a lot worse than what the warriors did, which admittedly was a, a terrible thing to do. But I don't think it's quite on the same scale as trying to slaughter the whole of humanity. So I think, yeah, I would quite like to see Reiner get the opportunity to say that to Erin. But I think I may be going a bit off piece there, to be honest. What about you, Marie? Honestly, I really agree with what Lost just said. Um, I, I hadn't thought about Reiner as a candidate, but it would be extremely interesting. And apart from that, I guess I would be interested to see Levi talking to him, but I wonder I wonder if they would have that much to say to each other at this point. So yeah. I've been convinced by by Lost. Right now would be a great candidate. Yeah, I, I I'm kinda with you guys too. Like I do I ideally Levi would get a chance just, but I, I think you've convinced me too. I think he said everything he needed to say in his in his monologue back in chapter, was it 112 or 113? 112, 112. Okay, 112. I mean, if 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 he had a chance to talk to Aaron, I think it would just be to express disappointment. That emotion doesn't serve anything on the battlefield. It's certainly not going to change Aaron at this point, but Reiner, because they've been set up as foils, and because Reiner is still trying to trying to understand what Aaron meant when he said, I'm the same as you, like even as recently as two chapters ago, he's like, huh, maybe that's, Reiner still isn't 100% sure what it meant. So for him to get the chance to weigh in on that to, to Aaron in person would be pretty amazing. Something else I've seen in the past months is, um, is some frustration about how, how quickly the Alliance has moved past any of their like hard feelings. They're not bringing up the past. These conversations usually involve like Reiner and Jean because of Marco or else Levi and Annie because Annie killed his whole squad. And, you know, th there is some grumbling that, that, that this is just a little bit unrealistic. I know I have thoughts, but what are yours? So I certainly think that the Alliance, that it, the Alliance is realistic because there's plenty of historical precedents of 
uh, former antagonists coming together and uniting, sometimes reluctantly, to fight a common enemy. So in that respect, I think it's not unrealistic for the warriors and the remnants of the Survey Corps to realise that the only way they're going to get anywhere is if they work together. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that. And it's a plot development that I, I quite like. Having said that, I do agree that it wasn't the speed with which they came together, because let's face it, they haven't got time. They have to move really fast here. So the speed didn't bother me, but I do think that it is a bit unrealistic that they didn't at least clear the air or at least hold each other responsible for what happened in the past, even if it was just to say, you know, I'll never be able to forgive you for killing my squad or for killing Marco, but I know we have to work together. Full stop. That's all it would need to have been. It could have been just that. But this silence, it seems like an omission. And again, you know, if if um, you know, looking at looking at it from a writing perspective, it does seem like an omission that could have been dealt with quite quickly and quite simply. Or, I mean, it could have been drawn out for chapters if you'd wanted, but obviously there's not time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, we had we had Marco, the Marco talk around the fire, and, you know, Jean did get a couple of swipes into Rhino. Yeah, that's true. But that's then true. we had the plane conversation where Connie is like, oh, yeah, we're all the same, which I bristled at that, too. Yeah, I don't feel it's really believable. And we got the characters now telling ourselves, telling us that they're, they're fine with it, basically, and we have to believe them for that. It feels like we're only seeing the result, and they had the discussion, but we weren't private to it. So it's a little hard to believe fully, and I feel there's a lot of conflict between characters or pair of characters that we could have also benefited from seeing instead of just the results. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so this chapter, when the boys are jumping off to go do their thing, there's that you know moment of don't die. You don't die either, which I think it goes beyond we're working together into something like friendship. And I don't actually mind it, but it's something I've noticed in the fandom. I think the fandom's not ready to let go of grudges yet. And that goes for the warrior stands as well. The warrior stands in our fandom don't necessarily like, especially that Bertold is being ignored. That's fair. That's very I fair. I can totally too. understand yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It does just feel like an omission in the writing. I do quite like what's happened with Annie and Mika, though. And I think we'll get into more of that later. That relationship is really working for me. And I don't know if that's just because I like Mika, and I like to see her having a friend. But their particular animosity... Of course, I don't think the story's ignored their animosity like it has, say, Connie's and Reiner's. I think these two, we've actually maybe seen them deal with it a little bit. There's definitely been some hostility. So seeing them come together now, while it's rushed, I don't find that unbelievable. I actually find that one of the bright spots. I have to confess that Annie's one of these characters that I've always been like <laughs> really lukewarm about. I'm trying to be polite here. I, I wouldn't say I dislike her. I just find her a bit, I don't know. Never, never I didn't re- never really engaged with her. So I'm a bit kind of like slightly shrug about it. yeah I did like her interactions with, with Mikasa this chapter I thought they were they worked quite well in the context of the chapter but I haven't really got any great insights beyond that I see what you mean because after all she was stuck in a crystal for so many chapters it, it, it's been hard to really I mean get get, get sympathy for her, in a, for her in a sense because we see her as an antagonist first and now she's out of a crystal and she's one of the allies I think it's really it's a bit difficult to warm up to that we don't know her that much yeah I agree I think that's my issue with her she was not a focus of mine the first 36 chapters I think she was in the story for what when was the female titan arc I mean it was early, early like it was yeah. done yeah, by was chapter early. 36 okay so we haven't really haven't seen much of Annie in a very long time but I don't remember her being this sassy or oh, she was. I, mean, I, I kind of got the impression she was from the anime first, and okay, yeah, I, she 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 seems pretty true to character, and I mean that with as little as we as we've seen, so it's not much, but she did seem a bit. 
I don't know, ironic and maybe not joking or right, but she, she's got the little air about her that's a little bit like she's not taking a lot of shit, but she can she can still joke with you, all right, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of my impression of her as well. She did get a lot of good moments here where she, um, you know, the scene where she tries to, you know, where's our man? Ooh, peak. And uh, she and Mikasa immediately latch onto that. I, I just, I do really like, I do really like watching their interplay. I'm happy that we've had that. And again, she's not a character I ever noticed and certainly not when she was interacting with anybody else, but um, her and Mikasa are just really working for me right now. I mean, it's another one of those characters that I feel we kind of forget or gloss over everything that's been happening in the past and know everyone is best, best buds with her. And I suppose she's earned her place back with these people. I believe that. Uh, it's just, I don't know. I, I can't help but feel it's another interaction and another resolution that we should have, we could have benefited from seeing more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, I, I think I'd... I would have much stronger feelings about Annie if we'd seen a lot more of her, uh, if we'd seen her interact with more characters. I think even at the end of the female Titan arc, because she was in her Titan form most of the time, she wasn't even she wasn't speaking. So it feels like almost we got a, we only got very little snippets of her character, not really enough to connect with. Well, that that was my feeling, and I do appreciate that you know there are some people who who love her and feel like she's a really powerful character which you know which is great but I I just never made that connection with her I kind of get also the feeling that I mean for story's sake and for brevity's sake that Annie Annie feels like she has witnessed everything that we have the same way we did like she came back and it's like she's got she, she, she's gotten the the chapter updates inside our, inside our crystal mm, that's interesting yeah it does feel like that doesn't it like she's matured along with the reader yeah, she she feels she definitely feels like she knows as much as almost mm. as much as we do, um, mm-hmm. which was not the it was not the case at all um, when she first got into the crystal. So I don't know, maybe there's kind of a Titan Wi-Fi. Did they have Wi-Fi <laughs> inside the crystal? <laughs> I don't know. She got updated. She got updated in some way. I'm sure. Of yeah, it. She, she, had Ar- she had Armin updating her, didn't she? Apparently, in Hitch it's as well. True. It's true. Yeah, she got the news daily from Armin and Hitch. Hitch was clearly reading the newspapers to her. I love, I was somebody, I saw a post, I guess it was on Twitter or Tumblr, where somebody was like, how quick Hitch was to um, stop Armin from touching her, but then she's like beating Annie's crystal with the newspaper. Now, Hitch, like, it has to be said, Hitch, I loved. I think Hitch yeah. was a great character. Yeah. I wish we'd seen more of Hitch. She was really nice to have around, Yeah. Yeah. I think you captured what I'm feeling. Like, I guess for me, Annie, there was a bookmark put into Annie when she went into the crystal, but that's not the feeling of the story. The story is that she's been progressing along with us and she just, you know, is able to jump right back in. She's grown where we've grown, which I guess it makes sense. I guess that was established. That feels a little bit, I don't know, it's not believable, but there are so many other unbelievable things going uh-huh. on. It's, it's well, fair. Yes. <laughs> I suppose, it, I suppose this, this part is fair, yes. It's a minor point. Yeah. I do love how she's like the world's worst babysitter, but possibly like a great best friend. (laughs) Like with Hitch and Mikasa, she's exactly the person you want to go to the mall with or whatever. You know, she's just like, she could be a great wingman. Yeah, but not not your first choice of babysitter. (laughs) Never your first choice of babysitter. I don't mean to keep bringing up criticisms of the chapter, but somehow those stick with me more than praise. But another area that um, in my meanderings around fandom, the fact that Gabby identified the shiny centipede. Let me just read it. When I did, something jumped out of Aaron's spine. It looked like a shining centipede or something, and it connected to Aaron's head. And then she goes on to say, that's the true nature of the power of the Titans. So Gabby, again, brilliant child that she is, not just a great shot, but apparently incredibly astute in making her observations, has talked about the, the, the shining centipede. And first of all, I want to say props to last month's podcast guest, LSJ, for calling it that that centipede was critical to the story and would most likely make another appearance. We talked about that for, I would say, 20 minutes last podcast. So if you want to 
hear those predictions. I think it was in the second half. There's probably a timestamp to LSJ's theory, but it was something I was quick to agree with. I mean, when we saw that centipede back in chapter, was it 123, Emir's backstory, I remember having conversations with people that were like, okay, this is world building. This is the mythology of the world. Will this be important? Will we ever know what that centipede is? Or is this just a quick aside? This thing happened. We set it aside and focus on other things. But it looks like Isayama's introducing the shining centipede yet again. Don't forget about it. It's connected to Aaron's head. If we cut his head off, we might see it again. So maybe this is an example of what you were saying, Lost, that uh, subtle as a sledgehammer talk where, in case you forgot it, here it is, and here's how we see it again, like very obvious talk. But I didn't think it was out of place. And that was a lot for me to say, so I will just toss it to you all to add your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that that it was always going to be significant because I don't think you could just throw in something like that without it being significant. Whether we'll get much of an explanation as to what exactly it is remains to be seen. And I'm actually quite happy with the idea that the Shining Centipede is the origin of the Titan powers because they had to come from somewhere. And I think I'm cool with Gabby reiterating that and reminding us of that. The one thing that does concern me slightly is, are we ever going to get any explanation as to where that came from? And if we don't, then it's a complete deus ex machina. And Mm. I'll be a little bit disappointed in that. I would like to have some explanation as to where did this thing come from? Was it a power that was always lurking there? Even just knowing that would be enough. I also think that this reminder is also quite convenient in that Gabby is pointing to this is the way that we break the power of the Titans because there's been speculation over the past few chapters is, you know, is it, do they need to kill Zeke? Do they need to kill Eren? Is it Ymir that's pulling the strings? What is the weak point that will break the power of the Titans? And now Gabby's pointing to the, the shiny silver thing. That's what you've got to aim at. So I think that's a significant. And given we are so close to the end, I think you say Amma needs a straightforward way to break that power, if indeed that's what he's going to do. Uh, And I think that's going to be it. But I would be a bit disappointed if we don't get some explanation as to the origin of that power. Yeah, she specifically calls it the true nature of the power of the Titans, which is pretty specific for a 12-year-old child. She knows knows a lot of things. Right. (laughs) Don't you start. (laughs) She She knows a lot of things, okay? She listens to the podcast, clearly. (laughs) (laughs) She was, okay, okay, she was at Titan Trainer School, and Marley did have the benefit of the Titan Research Society. So maybe I'm willing to accept the scenario that in, in baby baby Titan warrior school that they had to hit the books and learn everything possible about Titan. You know, like like this was a a field of study for Gabby and Falco and all of those kids. Like the science department was filled with very smart people. I could buy that. Are you telling telling us that uh, we need Gabby to do us a little abstract about the Ackerman power because yeah. I, I think that's the exactly. only way but that's even Zeke exactly. doesn't know about that nobody knows. even Zeke admitted he doesn't know shit about the Ackermans that, that's funny though because like we got the byproduct of Titan science once mm-hmm. and then never again and no one knows mm-hmm. what it is but to go back to Gabby um I'm, I'm really not opposed to the plot line that 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 goes like kill the parasite free all aliens that's all power of the titan is over i'm not sure i mean it's not a bad it's not a bad plot line but i really Mm -hmm. hope it's not only that because it would feel a little anticlimactic in a way that they know what needs to be done and they can spot it this quickly and i mean surely there's more going on with Eren in emir and there's going to have they're going to have to do other things i mean i hope so Yeah, I certainly agree with that. It would be a bit too convenient. And I think there has to be there has to be more of a resolution and there certainly has to be repercussions because the the point that the story has reached is not just down to the power of the Titans. There's 
a whole lot of other relationships and neurosis and complications that have brought everyone to the point they are at now and destroying the power of the titans will not resolve all that there is more that has to happen i'm seeing a lot of talk about accountability as well like um who really is the final boss if 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 the centipede is the final boss is he the one that's control you know there's the the conversation i think since chapter 91 or ever since i mean for the last since 91 certainly concerning aaron is is he being controlled by somebody or something and this has introduced a new player into that conversation oh i don't i don't think i don't think aaron has been controlled by anyone i think there is a power there that he is drawing on that he is accessing and that power could be sentient in some way, shape, or form. But I think a lot of Eren's actions are very, very much his own. And to some extent, Eren has actually been a very consistent character throughout the manga. He has just become more and more extreme in his actions. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. That looking back now, it's easy to see this progression. But I also see people too mentioning his Titan form looks like it's asleep. He's He appears as a child. Mm. You could make the case that he signed up for this, that he agreed to this, that this is his decision, that he willingly accepted the genocide for sure as himself. But since he's gotten into this state that there's a lot more at play than just him. Mm. But it's weird. It's so weird that he's asleep. His Titan form appears to be asleep all the time. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And we also see the present the presence of OG Emir, who is always watching, ever watching, ever knowing. I mean, I'm sure there's something there. And I suppose you're right. The question is more whether Aaron agreed to help or mm-hmm. if if in any shape or form he was behind it or if he or if he saw that as the only solution because he knew more than we do. There is a part of me that can't let go of the fact that he chose this. Yes, I agree. I think there's no doubt, even people who think that Aaron might be being controlled now or potentially is not responsible in some way for what's happening, agree that he made the deal with the devil. He absolutely took that step. Now, whether he regrets it at this point is something that I think that they'd like to debate, but this is his doing. He saw this the moment he kissed his Joria's hand, that there would be a future that he wanted and he's been going for it. So at this point, if he's asleep at the wheel and in a child form and somehow unable to make grown-up decisions, I don't think that that alleviates anything. Yeah, he kind of chose this path repeatedly and we saw him having the choice to pick another thing a number of times and he, he still didn't whether it's because he thinks it doesn't matter and it it wouldn't have changed at anything because he knows more from past from whatever um that's a possibility but the fact is that he still he still chose to kill everyone to resolve the problem it doesn't seem like a resolution at all it's interesting that you use the fr- the phrase uh, "grown up decisions," and I think I think there's actually something quite telling in that because I think you're right. I don't think Aaron has ever been making grown up decisions. I think he's he's always felt to me a bit like he's 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 frozen in a sort of childlike mindset. He's he's always been very volatile. <laughs> he does remind me a bit of a toddler sometimes. But I think it is <laughs> it was quite significant that you did see him regressing back to his childlike self and you know the the kind of freedom that he wanted as a child and the way he expressed his disappointment that the world beyond their shores was not the world he wanted that there were other people in it and he didn't want them there therefore he was going to get rid of them and there has always seemed to me that there is something very childlike in there and I think in a way, I can understand why some people have really appreciated that and connected to his character because of that. He had what initially appeared to be a childlike innocence to him and a belief that he could do almost anything. 
But I don't think he ever matured beyond that. And I think that's where it starts to become really dangerous and why the kind of decisions that he's made have been very selfish decisions. It's just this whole introduction of the centipede and the true nature of the power of the Titans. I, I'm i excited about that. I'm interested about that. And then it's like three chapters, like my laundry yeah. list of things. I made a list of all the things that I... I thought needed to have happened before this manga closes and paths shenanigans, the nature of Yoji and Mir and now the centipede, like this is such a big thing. It just feels very big that we're getting things are being introduced into the world building or being, or being yeah. brought back up it's again. Very at late in the day. Yeah. Maybe we'll get a centipede spinoff. <laughs> I've been saying like I wanted a Great Titan War spinoff because I feel like that's another area, the whole thing mm-hmm. with the Tiber and King Fritz yeah, and the houses, yeah. the Titan houses. We could have like this Game of Thrones styled understanding what happened, why it was so bad that Fritz decided to nope out of the world and go live mm-hmm. in the walls. But yeah, the same thing could go all the way back to OG and Mir now because we are, yeah. we're getting just more information about it. Yeah, I do agree that three chapters from the end is a little late to show us what the real enemy is in Erwin's terms. It sounds like it needed to be no, because if it was a no, it would be never. But there's yeah, definitely so a, that feeling that it's a bit rushed and a bit out of left field at, as well. Like, Gabby just knows, so Gabby tells us. And I mean, this manga has always been a game of catching, catching up with uh, what's really there, because we spend so much time not knowing anything. And... The information we know, start to get, is always, I suppose, going to feel a little bit weird because we're we're learning about it very not organically. Yeah. I think pacing has always been one of the weak points of the story, which, although having said that, you know, to sustain any kind of coherent narrative over 10 years is absolutely astonishing. I mean, I... I I can't express my respect for such a a young writer to be able to sustain that. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And clearly, you know, Isayama was introducing plot elements in the very early chapters that he is picking up now, you know, 10 years later. That's astonishing. So to some extent, it does feel a bit churlish to be to uh, criticise the the placing and the, the, the pacing and the plot dynamics sometimes. So I think it's inevitable that to try and sustain a story for that long, there are going to be wobbles in the pacing, which we have seen quite a lot of. And some chapters feel quite slow and then they become very rushed and you're left wondering about, well, what happened to that? And then it reappears over here. I think that's inevitable. And I think maybe, you know, this this is an example of that. And it's a problem when you're, you're writing a story with so much mystery in it, it's that the fans are mm. going to be so involved uh, even more than if it was a story about anything yeah. else. And they're going to pick up on anything, any thread that was not wrapped up, they're going to, p- to pick up on it. But I definitely agree with you, the work that Isaiah has done throughout the story to sustain it and maintain it believable and and just... Yeah, put clues there in the first chapters that we're learning about 10 years after. It's really amazing work that he done. It yeah. really is. And you guys, I, I, I'm just curious, you, you've you been in the series, both of you have been in the series for about six years now or more? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. 2015 I started following it, I think. Okay. Yeah, same. I can't believe we're still here. Yeah, me neither. Well, I, I, I think it is testament of just how... <laughs> powerful and effective Isayama's storytelling is and I know I've said this in other places before that for me what makes a story so compelling is the character dynamics I think that's really where Isayama excels he creates very complex characters with very complex relationships and to me that's what makes the story really engaging it's not the titan battles or the action or the fighting it's these character dynamics and every every character somehow feels believable in their own yes. way which is quite a fit considering that we 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 just had more and more and more i mean i, I did not count the living cast at this point but 
that's a lot of people that's a lot of people to have given um believable traits and a personality mm -hmm. of their own and mm -hmm. goals and dreams and that's a lot to catch up on i guess we can't be as involved in every of those characters at as maybe we should but just the fact that they exist with so much variety and so rich as rich as they are is really quite an achievement i would absolutely agree absolutely i would too i hope the shining centipede doesn't become a character like that though i hope he's just a, <laughs> you know it's like oh a new character <laughs> not for like again a name. <laughs> We did get an ask from Monica So. Do you guys think they'll kill the parasite and free all Eldians or wrong manga? So I think this speaks to kind of your beliefs about how this is going to end. They could. They definitely could. I also suspect it's not going to be as easy as Gabby makes it sound like. I hope it's not, but it definitely could. I wouldn't chance any guess for how it resolves. Maybe maybe they can't go past that and Titans remains in some form and maybe there there's peace or maybe maybe all Eldians end up free and there is still war. I mean both could work as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that both are linked. You could free all Eldians and I'm not sure I could still trust Tizayama to make it a peaceful end. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. And I think it sort of harks back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, it's it's not just about the power of the Titans. There's a lot more. There's a lot of other dynamics, social, personal dynamics in this mix. And while killing the the shiny beastie might destroy the power of the Titans, <laughs> it's not going to resolve all those conflicts magically and automatically. Um, and basically, they will still come. There will still be people, and there will still be people who want to fight each other. To heart back to Erwin's words. Um, but I think it is a possibility that the, the shiny centipede will be killed at some stage, perhaps. There are certainly, yeah, they seem to be aiming for it, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Gabby's got that gun. Gabby has got <laughs> Chekhov's gun there. We asked that in the poll if Gabby would snipe it because you, you've got <laughs> to wonder how, because I, I, I can't help but like look at that panel and look at that centipede and wonder if there's not going to be some scene where they chop off Aaron's head and something goes just slithering across the... It's, it's possible, I mean, and especially with such a weapon that we've seen Gabby with. And as the other characters tell her, she's not going to kill anyone with that. The enemy is too big and too powerful, so... I would guess it's not for that, yeah. But she's going to shoot something. It's for something else. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it, it might be for a shiny centipede. It, it, it does seem like shiny centipede sized. It does. It doesn't seem like it's gotten any... It's changed much from when OG Ymir was infected by it. Okay, so poll. Gabby discusses the centipede spine creature. Check all that you agree with. We've had uh, just under 2,000 responses. 75, close to 75% do agree that it is the actual spine creature that OG Emir encountered. 23% believe it's controlling Aaron. So that gives you an idea of just how many people think that Aaron is not necessarily... Mm. experiencing his own free will. So 23%, which I think is really high. It's not impossible, but it, it's really high. 11% think it's also controlling Emir. So that would make it seem as though it's the final boss. 50% <laughs> think it's um, that killing it will end the connection between all subjects of Emir, which I don't have any issue with that. 50% think killing it will end the Titans. And my favorite one, 20%, Gabby will snipe it. There's something interesting in here about this idea of control. If you envisage the, the shiny beastie as a parasite, then parasites, it's in their interest to keep their host alive. Otherwise, they themselves will die. But they're not, they're rarely actually controlling the host. So it could be that this thing this entity has infected or it is somehow OG Ymir has become the host of this thing potentially Eren as well but whether it's actually controlling every single one of their actions 
is debatable. Mm -hmm. Although you do get parasites that do actually control um, the yeah, host's like the actions. Sheep, the sheep ones. Yeah, the and cordyceps. It's amazing. The cordyceps yeah. fungus is that's a something that even like <laughs> that's a horrific thing. Definitely. But it, it could be. I mean, it could potentially be something like that. But it, it would it would cheapen a lot of things if the characters were suddenly if we were if we were told that they were not controlling their own actions for this mm -hmm. length of time, I think it would cheapen a lot of yeah. not only the characters but all the all the plot around them, all the yeah. care, all mm -hmm. the dynamics. And and it's like we said earlier, I mean it's it's you know, if you look at Aaron's reasoning for what he is doing, that hasn't changed from when he was a small child. Aaron has always had a thing about freedom and he's always had a very particular conception of what freedom means to him, which is not an idea of freedom that I particularly recognise, but he's always had this idea, his own idea of freedom, and that's what he will fight for. And that hasn't really changed, I don't think, throughout the, the manga. It's just he now has this astronomical power um, that he can exercise to achieve that freedom. Uh, yeah, I would be quite disappointed if it did turn out that Eren's every action has been controlled by an external sentient entity and that he has been has had no hand in this at all. That would feel to me to be out of kilter and out of character with the rest of the story. It is interesting because it's obvious that this centipede, this true nature of the Titan power, is part of what's keeping Aaron alive. The fact that, I mean, even though the centipede hasn't been mentioned since 123, I've noticed that Aaron's Titan form resembles it. You know, there's been hints all along that it's still an active player. But like you were saying, what their relationship is, I also very strongly hope that that this centipede is, I think, I don't know that you worded it quite this way, but it's the battery that's powering this. It's yeah. not mm -hmm. a sentient creature. It's just the battery. Mm -hmm. or, it, or it could be that it's sentient to the degree that it wants to survive, mm -hmm. but that it's not actually controlling the every actions of its host. I really love last month, LSJ describing it like you did as a parasite and how the act of eating... When you're passing a parasite on, oftentimes mm -hmm. it's through consumption and that the whole yeah. form of there's eating their yeah, predecessor, that would make a lot of sense. they're infecting each other and yes. that that's, you know, whereas it would also potentially be in the DNA, just bloodline. So yeah. it's, it's something in their blood. It comes up in those blood tests, but mm -hmm. the shifters have it more profoundly because they're actually eating portions of each other. And I think it's no, so it's no coincidence that, um, Zeke's spinal fluid is used mm -hmm. to convert Eldians into Titans. I mean, it, I think it all ties into this, I, this parasitic idea. So from one fantastical creature to the next, we uh, move into the battle and we see more of these just really fantastic Titan designs, including one that um, Titan folk has dubbed the Big Chungus Bunny. And Marie, I, I'm not an artist, but I have to ask you, it seems to me Isayama's having a lot of fun at this point in the story. As an artist, are you seeing evidence of that? Yeah, I would agree with you that I definitely get the sentiment that he's having as much fun as he can at this point. And not only because it's the end, but also because the story progressed so much, uh, we have to remember that the setup within the walls didn't allow for a lot of fantasy. I know in his said now that they're out in the open, I would be going I would be going for it really, really badly too. It's not only the designs, it's also like the sheer scale of things. We've seen a lot of wide expanses of sea and skies. And of course now Eren's Titan design, all the Titan invocations, if I can say, designs as well. Do you think that's part of that is like maturity and confidence as an artist? Maybe it's in one part, but I suppose it's also linked to the fact that he can now. He has a setup for it. He has a skill for it and some kind of grand finale um, feeling as well. I mean, the art has definitely progressed so much through the years. It's still in places, I suppose it's always consistently inconsistent, but I really like it. <laughs> Uh, it's got its own flavor and its own quality, and 
it's definitely linked to skill advancing, but I suppose it's also linked to story advancing and you've got to go all out, I suppose, at this point. And it, yeah, I would be doing the same. I was, I think I said last month that it, it almost has like that uh, campy B-movie quality feel now to see all these just really crazy Titan designs. But I think Isayama's always been a little bit campy. But he, and he's always had fun with his art, but it's like he can just go all out. He's, he has to draw a million titans. He might as well draw them. Yeah, exactly. It's linked to like how the story is set up as well. Like we're, I mean, we tend to forget, I suppose, but we're still talking about a story about like giant people eating each other. And remember how in the first, how many chapters, I don't even know, all titans were really human like. We had to get the sense that. In some, at some point, they were humans. We didn't know that, but we had to get the sense that something had happened to humans to end up this way. And now that we know that, you can go, you can go much, much further. And yeah, we've seen the examples of Isayama drawing, like his staff as titans, or famous people he's seen in in movies as yeah. He's always had fun, but I guess if you're going to write a story about giant humans hitting each other and you're in the last chapters you might as well yeah have as much fun as you can one thing we asked on the poll i'm i'm as i'm flipping through the chapter i'm at the part where the uh warhammer archers are firing at falco which was really i thought like a really cool scene but i was a little bit like side-eyeing the fact that you know this is falco's first transformation mm -hmm. he's <laughs> never been a titan before and yet he's able to like outmaneuver a horde of titan archers with his evasive flight maneuvers i mean it's i don't mind it because it makes for a great story like if i was going to sit down and like analyze the scene i would be <laughs> very critical, but just to kind of take it at face value is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, especially, but I, I get what you mean, especially since we've seen how much of a training arena to have to control his Titan and to see everyone else just stay to it. I mean, maybe Aaron is just really bad at being a Titan. <laughs> <laughs> that, that scene, the thing that that scene with the archers reminded me of it's just it's such a classic scene that you see in um classic Japanese cinema like Kurosawa films mm -hmm. where you see you know the massed ranks of the archers and these sort of huge you know batteries of arrows flying and it was like oh it's that <laughs> but yeah certainly I mean I've, I'm not an artist at all but um I think I've really enjoyed the the art and in this chapter in particular, the one thing that continually astonishes me is that Isayama sets up these designs <laughs> that must be really complicated to draw. I mean, it started off with the, you know, the, the 3DM gear, which must have been a nightmare to draw every <laughs> month. And now this, I mean, Eren's Titan now is such an amazing stage set. I mean, it really is phenomenal. And the way that they're kind of maneuvering and fighting their way through that and swinging from it it's just incredible but you just think that must be bloody hard to draw I mean really I yeah. see people already like rip Mappa for having to animate it oh man <laughs> yeah and it, it it kind of feels like they picked the position before they knew as well so yeah. now they're stuck with <laughs> Did it they see these chapters <laughs> yeah didn't Isayama at some point regret doing the 3DMG, but then he does the bondage gear next. Like, yeah. okay, did not learn lesson. <laughs> and now he's done this. He likes a certain <laughs> flavor and that comes at the price, I guess. It really does. <laughs> I do wonder, I'm sure he's got a team of people helping him, but I'm sure like it's his manga. He's drawing the bulk of this. They're yeah. doing the shading, they're adding the lines, but this is these are his designs. I would be really interested in knowing what exactly, what kind of assistance does he have and what kind of parts do they draw because there are certain people that they only ever draw some kind of storyboard and the assistants go in and draw the actual thing. I'm not sure it's the case with Isayama. I mean, we definitely see his style throughout the pages. So I would, I would guess he still does a lot of work, uh, drawing work, yeah. even at that point. My head canon is that somebody else draws the horses, that Isayama can't draw a horse <laughs> to save his life. 
And so he has an assistant do all the horses, which is just a head cannon. Because, and I only say that because of the whole, the conversation that he can't draw, he can draw a Titan ass, but he can't draw a human one. And those horses are like, he always like really accentuates their, their, their hind part. And I. Hind part. <laughs> What do you call that part on a horse? I used to know this. I used to be really into horses. The, not the, the withers. The withers? Or... No, I don't know. I'm not a horsey person. <laughs> You're fail as a horse girl. 16-year-old Momtaku. <laughs> it would be devastated that I cannot remember horse anatomy. But he really focuses on that with human characters, not so much. So I don't know. Are you airing your grievances for some characters? Very flat posters. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. I will share with you a funny story from the poll. So when we were writing the poll, the last two chapters, we've um, included a section about, you know, which new plot development did you enjoy or not enjoy? And Kevin, who's brand new to the poll team, talked about these archers having stormtrooper aim, which I laughed heartily over because they like literally, I don't even want to count how many stormtroopers or how many stormtroopers, yes, how many <laughs> archers they are. But the fact that Falco is huge and not one of them hit him was, again, I don't mind it because it's fun. It's awesome. But when I take off my fun glasses and look at this, I'm like, okay, we've got stormtroopers. I'm sorry, but in a story where we've got shiny silver centipedes, this is absolutely the least of my worries. I know. I, I didn't even notice that their aim was very bad. <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> I love the comparison to the stormtroopers, though, because I'm sure that's exactly what it's going to look like animated. It's just firing round after round and Falco just effectively dodging them without any trouble. But like you were saying, Lost, that's not unusual in Japanese cinema, especially it is. Not the monster it's, movies. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The minions are rarely effectual. They rarely even get a hit in. So mm-hmm. the last comment about the Titan designs, though, we really had put Big Chungus Bunny in there, hoping that he would take most fantastical design. And let's see. I voted for the Okapi Titan, I'm afraid. We put Big Chungus Bunny in there thinking people would enjoy the chance to vote for him as the most fantastical Titan shifter. But no, it was the Warhammer Archers. Our big Chungus Bunny is second. I don't think he's going to catch up. Oh, Copy got very few, only 13% of the vote. I I feel this is in one of those cases that the characters remarked it upon it. So Mm. the spotlight has already gone over it and no one's going to pay it any mind whether like the other ones are going to get all the interests. It has to be said, the Warhammer Titans are always very elegant. They've got something going for them. They really do. Yeah, they're very pretty, yeah. The most hotly debated thing in the poll is whether the Okapi is a cart, beast, or jaw titan. (laughs) By the way, it's like uh, we're split between cart and beast, 44 to 46%. So jaw titan's losing. Asking the real questions here. Asking the real questions. Is the Okapi titan a cart, beast, or jaw? So what do you guys think? Yeah, it's got such a small head, I would say cart. So here's the thing. I can tell you that it's a female Okapi because male Okapis have got little horns. Oh. (laughs) We're going into Okapi meta now. We are. We are. You know the way giraffes have these little kind of horn things? Male Okapi have them as well, apparently. Wow. So So that is a lady. That is, it could be the female Titan. Wow. It could be. (laughs) That's fresh information right there. That hot <laughs> off the press. This, you heard yes. it here first. <laughs> you did. You did. Huh. Well, now we know. <laughs> well, now that makes me want to vote cart. Maybe the cart yeah. works better with women. Yeah. Because women, okay, lost, you'll know the answer to this. Don't women have more endurance than men? Like, like is that a fact or am I making that up? Oh, no, absolutely. Well, look at okay. us. We're still in the fandom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if it's female, I like the idea of it's a cart because that would be more of a connection with Peak, who, by the way, no doubt about it, chapter MVP this month, 65% of our fandom selecting our girl Peak. And I say our girl Peak because I know for <laughs> a fact from our many conversations, you two love her. Absolutely. <laughs> She's best girl. Definitely. Agreed. 
I want to share a comment we got on Twitter from our friend Paris. He said, I needed this chapter. Peak was amazing. Her popularity in the anime and her outstanding moments in this final arc have solidified her as one of my favorites. Now, she was one of your favorites long before this. I don't remember when you guys fell in love with Peak, but it was pretty early on. I think when we when we found out who the person was behind the card titan, and it's this super cute girl who was extremely fun and intelligent all the time, and you're like, oh my god. She's definitely a type. <laughs> she is a type. And I often think, this will come back later too, how we three and others... We've chosen our favorites very, very well. Like we have. <laughs> yeah. We have good taste. You you can we say do. it. <laughs> <laughs> our, when we select a favorite, it's like we just we get rewarded for it again and again and again. And I think zeroing in on Peak as a character that we just adored, like it just gets better and better. And again, I think, you know, she is a really good example of Isayama's ability to create really compelling characters because the thing is peak hasn't actually had an awful lot of screen time in the manga i mean she she appears at very and she has played a very important role but she hasn't been with us for a huge length of time but you know as marie said people immediately took to her because well she was she's very cute she's very a very appealing character but she's funny she's sassy and she's massively intelligent which I think is what really sets her apart in some way she has a kind of intelligence that isn't entirely believable and she's also very principled and I think that's one of the things that I've always really loved about her is that she is she's she's got these really deeply held principles and she also does not mess about and I just love how she's completely brutal in her assessment of Erin. <laughs> I think, you know, she she calls it like she sees it. Oh, yeah, last chapter, you're not my friend, vanish nightmare. Like, it doesn't get better than that. That was brilliant. I often thought that Peak had the kind of energy that uh, if we were to go into the manga and tell Erin exactly what we thought, it would be something like that. Yes. She's yeah. that character. Mm-hmm. And as Lost said, she really takes no shit. And she's the only one. I mean, mm-hmm. everyone is deep in turmoil and thinking about it all over and over again. And Pick is over here, makes it very clear she doesn't give a damn about Erin. Yes. She's always taking that role and she continues, as you said, to take it. And she takes action, was, especially when everyone else cannot. I think that's quite, that's quite refreshing. Mm-hmm. She doesn't hesitate. No. Um, she acts, and uh, again, I can't remember what chapter it's in, but the um, the the where is the enemy panels? Oh yeah, um, yeah. Are, are just you know stunning, absolutely stunning. She was absolutely fearless, and I love that chapter too. Her her assessment to Gabby when she takes Gabby by the hand and yes. says, you know, I don't care for Marley. I am not part of this, but I believe the people I fought with. Like you know, just she she looks beyond political and really focus on people for who they are and that's how she judges them. I think there's something quite interesting there and in that I think I mean personally speaking one of the reasons why I really love Peaks a character is that she does have these deeply held convictions and she clearly cares a great deal about her family, about her comrades, about the people that she has spent time with. And I find that very believable. And I think it's quite interesting to contrast that with Erin, who, you know, saving his friends has always been a big thing, but he doesn't treat his friends with any respect at all. And I think it's kind of like there's some quite contrasting portrayals of friendship between Peak and Erin there. Yeah, you're right. It feels like... Erin likes the idea of his friends yes. and speaks like yes. her friends as they yes. are. Yes. This month, did you find the reveal of her? We're going to go Dragon Ball Z here. Her Super Saiyan powers realistic? Or... <laughs> She's a carrot titan. How realistic do you want it to be? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I thought that was great, actually. I thought I thought that was really good because... 
I, I mean, she's clearly been very brave and, um, you know, fought really hard and all the things we've already said, but the cart Titan was never the most dynamic of the, the Titans. So I thought it was really good to to see this and it was very well done and it still kept an element of, of humour in it as well. So no, I, I liked it. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, if we're talking about realism, I mean, Armin can survive a whole barbecue. <laughs> so <laughs> I, see, I see no problem with Thick transforming repeatedly. And yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, it even makes more sense for her than other things we've seen, considering that we know she can remain in Titan form for lengthy periods of time. So the fact that she can repeatedly transform, honestly, it's more realistic than a lot of other things. I agree. Can't argue with that. Going back, way back when we first saw baby Zeke and he's playing with a little plush monkey titan, I mm-hmm. remember thinking um, that how cool it would be if like LD and children had like action figures of all the different titans and or even maybe mm-hmm. Marleyan kids because, you know, I could see them being really cool action figures and whatever and and how you'd get a cart titan for Christmas and you'd be like, ew, the cart titan. But, you know, <laughs> because... I, I know watching the anime with my family, like the first time my daughter saw the cart titan, she was kind of repulsed. And of course, I was like, just wait. Mine too. Like it. it has to be yes. said. Like it's the least cool looking of all the titans. Like if I had to pick mm-hmm. a titan power that I wanted, but this chapter changes everything. Suddenly, yeah. Peak's titan is the coolest, as cool <laughs> as anybody's. I take back any any ooze or any, ugh, I wouldn't want to be that titan. She... She's the real deal. She is the badass Titan. And I just want to read a quote from our friend Amica on Twitter. She said, the feeling when Peak is not only the Armin of the warrior group, but also the Mikasa, which I thought summed up chapter 136 entirely. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's, yeah. Absolutely the girl power Mm -hmm. chapter. This is, this is between Annie, Peak, and Mikasa. Like they are carrying the team. I like that for them. Yeah. There was another comment about um uh somebody saying if if um if Peak had been part of the original expedition to Paradise to recover the Finding Titan, they would have got it right away. <laughs> I agree. And, and it would have been a much shorter story. Oh, I saw that meme. It was like um the giant book was a little tiny book. That's I saw yes, that on that's Twitter. The one. Yep, yeah. Yes, it was Twitter. It was Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> You do wonder, like, I I, I know this came up in the anime recently, like, just how, what was Marley thinking sending those kids? And not Peak, and not not even the older of the kids, but the three younger of the kids. Do you think it was like, we have no idea how hard it's going to be, let's let's send those ones, and uh, we got back up, Mm. just in case? I don't know. I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, it's, it's... Titan shifters seem to be like a renewable resource for them. So. Yeah, maybe they were the, the, the right age bracket to get uh, into the survey corps as spy as well. I don't know. <laughs> Was that a consideration? Yeah, and I guess I thought maybe that, you know, the younger children would be more likely to be overlooked than the, the, the young adults. Well, yeah, but also what age could have picked been back then? Mm, yeah, that's a good point. But Armin survived being barbecued, so does it really matter? Like, yeah, you're right, you're right. I mean, I mean, it's like we try to meta some of this and it's just not mm, meta-able. Yeah, yeah. I think you've just got to just wave it on. <laughs> things things also just happen, even in very calculated storylines, so. Mm. So we've been talking about an hour and a half, but before we go on break, I wanted to bring up the topic of the humor this chapter, because this encounter with with Peak and Jean was one of those funny moments. She's basically mid-sentence, and then she makes this expression when she realizes that he's gone and not listening. And there was just a lot of humor this chapter. There was Annie being incredibly funny when she said, you know, the your childhood friends just love getting kidnapped. There was um, the bickering over the Titan. There was Zeke, which we'll get to later, saying, Hello, Aaron's friend. There were just little moments of humor interjected throughout this chapter. Did that bother you? Because I know it bothered some people. It didn't bother me in this chapter. I think um, I think there was so much action in this chapter that I actually thought it actually fitted in quite well. 
I quite liked it. The kind of chapters where I do not like seeing that kind of humour are where the focus is very much on Erin and the rumbling and the slaughter of people. But in this chapter, I think... Um, I think it did. It did have that kind of levity, and it was it was very fast, and it was all action, and it was changing perspectives really quickly, um, and there was all kinds of things happening all at the same time, and nobody died. I don't think. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody died in this chapter. So I'm, you know, I'm absolutely cool with the humour in this chapter. Previous chapters where there has been, you know, outright slaughter, I think it would have been totally out of place. But in this chapter, I was fine with it. I quite enjoyed it. I I, I thought the the scenes with the Okapi Titan were great. <laughs> yeah, same, same. It felt like a good place to have it, especially since everyone's gearing up for the last battle. It seems so. It might be it might be the the only place to put some humor in. And as Lost said, there was not any great tragedy happening. Just people coming together and. Uh, deciding to fight back, which I suppose is a great place to have some humor in. I guess we also are going to see much, much less of it in the next chapters. So that's very fine with me as well. Mm -hmm. It felt like a sort of injection of energy building up to the, 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 the final denouement. Yeah, it also feels like the characters themselves are ready to go. You know, like mm -hmm. they actually can crack jokes. I think that's how I felt too. It, it it did not feel unnatural. Sometimes the humor feels a little unnatural or he'll draw a panel just to be funny. I mean, granted, Big Chungus Bunny showing up there is a humor, it, but it's not something I didn't appreciate. And But the dialogue humor here, I definitely, um, I enjoyed. I mean, you're going to die probably in the next, you know, whatever, or yeah. you're going to live, try <laughs> and, you know, to to be able to crack a joke or 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 say something at somebody else's expense. I think I agree with you, Marie, that it shows a, it shows a level of their resolve that they've accepted this and they can be themselves. Okay. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to get into our, probably our favorite part of the chapter being Levi's monologue. And we'll also be covering Zeke and Armin in paths. So we will be right back. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. We're about to discuss Levi's monologue, which I know for was a highlight, uh, obviously a highlight of this entire, I would say of this entire arc for me. And, and it's interesting too, because I wanted Lost and Marie as guests since I started doing the podcast two and a half years ago, but we were waiting for the right Levi chapter. And I mean, Levi has been, there just has not been a good Levi chapter. He's either dead blown up, being carted around, you know, making a few cute little comments here and there. We had the nice moment um, right before, like you were mentioning, I think in, in um, 112, but this feels like it. This feels like it's going to be as good as it gets. And we might get more Levi in future chapters. But this to me was, I, I don't want to call it the moment that clarified everything with Levi. But it certainly was the moment for me that kind of just wrapped everything up. It, uh, I think I wrote on Tumblr, there was no new information here. It just reminded us of what we already knew and provide clarification on a few things that we suspected but didn't know for sure. I know that you all were equally as enthusiastic as I was. So I think I want to toss it to you. Marie Lost, what did you, what was this like for you to finally get this monologue? I'm going to pass over to Marie first because if I start talking about this, I might be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was very striking for me because the fact is there is not a single new information in Livia's monologue at all. There is not one bit of information that we've we haven't known for literal years, and it's perhaps at this point the most immo immovable object, I guess, of all the series. And I really like that for him. I like that he stayed 
he really stays true to who he is in a way. I feel like this kind of resolve also also very much mirrors Kenny's resolve. And we know how much Isayama likes to keep his themes consistent. I guess he didn't clarify anything at all in the sense that we already knew all that he said. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Levi has been one of the most consistent characters in the whole series. And really what this internal monologue did was just reiterate and confirm everything that he has said before, everything Isayama has told us about him before, and just laid it all out again. And one of the things that did really strike me reading it was that there's a there's an interesting chapter in the uh, character encyclopedia which Isayama published. I think 2017. I think it came out. He says something along the lines that by staying with Erwin until his death, Levi has more or less fulfilled his purpose in the story, and that all remains for him is to kill the Beast Titan. And he then goes on and talks about. You know, but what will Levi fight for now? Obviously, he still has to kill the Beast Titan. And then he starts talking about how Armin replaces Erwin as the leader of the Survey Corps. And it did feel to me as though Levi put all that into words, that he what he said in this internal monologue was exactly what Isayama himself said in the character guide four years ago. And I think it was quite interesting that that character guide came out immediately after chapter 84. In fact, I think it was actually published. I think the Japanese edition was published the same month as chapter 84 or just the following month. And it came in to clarify a lot of what had happened in the manga there. So it did really feel to me like that's what Levi was doing, was he was putting all that into words again to just reinforce it and to to really bring it home. I think it's interesting because I remember, I mean, we both get a lot of asks in our inbox and we we talk we about do. Levi a lot. and. I remember the the character or the it wasn't the character encyclopedia or maybe it was where he explained the Acker bond, which is something mm-hmm. you and I had talked about a lot. And mm-hmm. people would come to my inbox and say, "Oh, it's not canon. If it's not mm-hmm. in the manga, it's not canon." And mm-hmm. then boom, it goes in the manga. <laughs> he actually talks yeah. about. And this is another state of that where he, it's 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 something that he talked about very specifically. And we accuse him in interviews of saying everything and nothing. But it really is remarkable when he says these things and and they shape our view. And then four years later, he puts it almost verbatim Mm -hmm. in the manga. And at that point, nobody can, it's no longer a death of the author to ignore the interview because it's in the manga now. This is in the manga. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the, the clarification of the Akerbon came, it was in the answers book. That was was the the, the answers Mm -hmm. fan book. That was the first one that came out. That's where he spoke about the Acker Bond, and he spoke quite a lot about um, Kenny and Yuri and Levi and Kenny's relationship in that one. And then the character encyclopedia, he spoke about, he spoke a lot about Erwin and uh, Levi's vow to Erwin in that one. But he, you're absolutely right. He's almost like he's 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 laying it all out in these books and then bringing it into the manga, working all these elements into the manga, just to, I think really to reinforce them. And I think you know, in terms of you know, as you said. We do get we do both get a lot of asks on Tumblr, and certainly something that I've noticed is that I get quite a lot of asks about: Do I feel that Levi needs to move on from his vow, or that he's driven by violence, or he's blinded by hatred, or he needs to sort of leave all this behind? That he needs to grow and move on. Yep. And that's that's re- one of those. That's one of those fandom things that has driven me to violence. Like I literally <laughs> yeah, want to yeah. scream every time I see somebody saying that. Yeah. And and the thing is that that's that's not who Levi is, and he, he that's not who he was at the beginning of the manga. He starts the manga as a fully formed adult character. And he hasn't deviated. He hasn't changed. You know, he's not a teenage shonen protagonist. He's not going to go on this journey of discovery. He's, you know, kind of like old and pissed off. And he is who he is. And he made a commitment before the manga even began 
which again, going back to the answers book, it's, you know, Erwin said to him, let's save humanity together. And that's what he's still trying to do. And that has not changed. Levi is very much the heart and soul of the survey corps. And he has remained true to that. And his one of the things that I quite often say in responding to these asks is that Levi made his vow to Erwin and Erwin is the significant person in his life. And again, Isayama reiterates this in the answers in the character encyclopedia. But although Levi made his vow to Erwin, he made it on behalf of his comrades, on behalf of the survey corps. He swore that vow in order to ensure that his comrades' sacrifice had meaning, that they did not die for nothing. And I think Levi's commitment to the Survey Corps and to saving humanity has remained right through all 136 chapters, and that hasn't changed. And I think that's that's really why I feel he is this, he's a very, very consistent character and I don't think he's going to radically change now. And it's one of the reasons I think why he's a very appealing character as well. He, you know, Levi did his character growth before the main arc of the manga started. I mean, if you if you want that, you need to go and read the No Regrets manga. Not the, don't watch the anime. <laughs> go for the manga or the um, the visual novel. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that's it, it's one of these questions that I get asked repeatedly and I find myself answering over and over and over again and I'm not quite sure why it keeps coming up in some ways. <laughs> I wonder too because everyone's I mean it's become a, th- a meme now must kill monkey must that that's the only thing in Levi's brain. Obviously that's not the case he's fighting alongside with mm-hmm. everyone else. Zeke is his priority and if I'm reading this conversation right, I understand now why Zeke was his priority. Mm-hmm. I, I do think that that sentence, our role may have ended there when we got those brats to the sea. Like uh, if, if I wrote a post where I basically took this frame by frame and talked about what I think it meant. And I love the idea that Levi is old Survey Corps. I think about- he is. He even wears a cape. Even, yes. You, even, yeah. Mm-hmm. When he showed up, remember that huge debate we got into in chapter one, oh, <laughs> whatever it was yeah. about why Levi was wearing the cape and nobody else. And we 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 kind of had the idea that it's because he's old Survey Corps. He's never moved on. Mm-hmm. To me, that's exactly what this is saying. His role, the Survey Corps as a group was responsible for clearing the island. They didn't know it was an island, but clearing their known land of Titans and getting back the land that they lost. Their, the Survey Corps ended when they reached the ocean. They, they did their job. Their charter was fulfilled. The only bit of that charter for Levi that wasn't left was killing Zeke. I love how forward-thinking Levi was in understanding that their charter would end, but that Armin's would continue. Levi's charter went to the ocean and Armin's went beyond that. I mean, I think we we maybe had thought of those ideas, but you know, we knew that he was old Survey Corps. We knew that his focus was in the past and not necessarily, it was always on humanity, but mm-hmm. it was connected to that past. And now we know why, because that was his mission. His mission, the Survey Corps mission stopped there. And granted, people like Hanji would want to join the new Survey Corps. She would want to be all about a whole world of things to explore and discover. But that's never been Levi. I think he does. He definitely it does still have this commitment to saving humanity oh, yeah. beyond the shores of paradise. But I think, yes, you're absolutely right. He is, he's old school Survey Corps to the core. And I mean, it's it's interesting. I know you mentioned the the... the the cape discourse is a throwaway thing, but it, one of the things that's quite interesting about that is that Isayama did a Q&A session in 218 and, and uh, somebody asked him about Levi's cape. And he did actually say that it is, a, it is a new cape, but he couldn't adapt to the other changes. So he kept his uniform and blades. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was in the, the an autograph Q&A that he did in 2018. And it does sound a very really light thing to do. And it, it, 
I mean, there's definitely an aspect in that of getting the new generation, if I may call it so, to another place in this kind of classic shonen trope, if I can say, which I don't very much like. But the way it's been brought up with, as you said, Levi remaining himself and remaining old survey corps, and I think that works. If it has to work, then it works better this way. And it also reminds me of this conversation between Erwin and Levi when he asks Erwin, what, what's he going to do once, once he's reached his dream? And Erwin says he doesn't know because he has to see it first. And I feel like in some part, yeah, Levi also doesn't know what to do with all that now. And he says, he says so himself when he says that his role has ended, has ended back on the island. Yep. I certainly agree with that. And I think, you know, again, that I know there was a lot of um, discussion and I think some degree of misunderstanding about what Erwin meant when he said that he didn't know what he would do. Some people took that as a suggestion that he had he had no will beyond the basement, which <laughs> seemed bizarre to me. <laughs> um, can you imagine what Erwin would have done with all that knowledge? Yeah, I always thought it was more of a cautious reply of who knows yeah. what's up there. You don't uh, know. It was a very, it was a very adult response, I think. And, and didn't Erwin smile when he said it, like it was an appealing idea? Yeah, it seems uh-huh. to me like yeah. he was. He looked pl- like it was like, oh, well, that's like you know, oh, hmm. And and after, I mean, he was the master of hedging his bets, so he was never going to, <laughs> um, he was never going to commit before he had all the information. But I, I certainly agree with Marie that I, you know, I've. I'm really not a fan of this idea of like, you know, kids saving the world. But in this case, I think, I think you're right. You know, Levi saw a role for himself and he, um, I think, I think he probably wants to hand that responsibility over now. You know, he's been fighting almost his entire life and you do get the feeling of somebody who wants to lay down their burden a bit. I don't think he's ready to give up fighting at all. I think he I I genuinely think he will fight to his dying breath but I think that he ha- is also prepared and I think has already handed over um the way forward to the younger members of the core and to Armin in particular. Yeah, and I like that I guess I can understand that it's out of necessity for the plot to develop but I still can appreciate the way it's done um because Levi remains true to himself in doing it so that makes it more believable and I'm a little bit more okay with that than I was I guess 80 chapters ago yes (laughs) a lot of yeah things have developed since then it really has there's um panels uh, sitting around the fireplace yeah that was lovely all the faces every single person in that is dead they're all gone Mm -hmm. like we knew all Mm -hmm. of these characters they were all characters that we enjoyed and it really really showcases He's he's the last one. He's he's the end of the Survey Corps. He is, you know, it's the Alliance now. It's not the Survey Corps anymore. The only one wearing the wings now is Peak of all people, which I think probably means something. Yeah, it's very suiting. Yeah, it suits her. I mean, I, I must admit, I did, I did speculate, and I think a lot of us actually did uh, way back as far as you know, chapter eighty four, when we were wondering, you know, where does Levi go from here? That. Isayama would be cruel enough to have Levi as a last man standing. And that's exactly what he's done. In terms of the veterans, Levi, of course, is the last one. All the rest are dead. And you do definitely get that feeling that he belonged to that world and he still does belong to that world. And and again, it's not to suggest that he won't fight to his dying breath for the people who are there with him now and and for the future of humanity. But he definitely feels like he has one foot in the past, if not two. I would say two. Well, let's look at some of these panels individually. One that struck me, of course, is right in the beginning. I've never bungled one of his orders, not even once. Mm. And yet, for some reason, his final order is the one that I just can't dot, dot, dot. And then a picture of Erwin with one of the saddest expressions that we've seen. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that's a heartbreaking panel. It really is. I mean, th- those three panels are, is it two or is it three? They're, yeah, they're really heartbreaking. And I think it, it's interesting to see 
the way that Erwin looks through Levi's eyes. He he always looks very soft, and he's frequently smiling. But in that panel, he he looks very downcast, and it does very much seem to be a reflection on Levi's own state of mind. He he himself feels that he's he's failed or he's disappointed that he's not been able to fulfil this order and is clearly projecting that onto his memory of Erwin. But I think the other thing that's really interesting about that panel is that he characterises this as Erwin's last order. Yeah, and when it, of course, it never was. It, it wasn't an order. Um, in I think it's in 81, Erwin says that he has a plan and then I think it's in 82 or 83 that you actually hear him articulate that in a flashback to the, the new recruits, explaining that they will launch a suicide charge to enable Levi to take down the Beast Titan. And Levi, of course, in that famous panel, kneels down and says, I will make the choice. I will take down the Beast Titan. Uh, so it, it's something that Levi has taken on himself. It's it wasn't a direct order, but again, there are precedents for this elsewhere in the manga. There are other instances where Erwin has presented Levi with a choice rather than giving him an order, as you might expect with a subordinate from a commander. And the example that springs to mind is when he asks Levi, "Will he take this Titan serum?" rather than that. And, he, and Levi actually calls him out and, on him and says, well, if you want me to take it, just order me to do it. And they have one of these kind of like silent conversations between each other. Um, so I think it is it is interesting that, that Levi is characterizing this as an order. And it really shows, it really shows to me, that was the most striking thing about this chapter really for me, but it really showed that in the moment where Levi made the promise to Erwin, he actually spoke Erwin's thoughts back to him. They were not his own. Now he takes that, he sees that as an order when it, it never was one, but he sees that as an order because those were not his thoughts. Those were Erwin's thoughts that he gave back to him because Erwin needed them. I can't believe how many mentions. Okay. Lost. How many times yeah. have we seen the crate scene now? <laughs> uh, we've seen the crate scene four times. We saw it first in 80, and then we saw it in 84 in flashback, and then we saw it in 112, and now we've seen it in 136. So that's four times in the manga alone. <laughs> it also turns up, of course it turns up in the anime, but I think what is perhaps more interesting is it turns up in a lot of the official art and it turns it up in the subs in the supplementary games as well. So mm. it is clearly one of the pivotal scenes of the story. And I think regardless of how you see Erwin and Levi's relationship to each other, it is a pivotal point in the story dynamics of the series. And the fact that Isayama keeps coming back to it and back to it and back to it shows that I think it is still going to have some significance before the story ends. And there's a new uh, VR um, ride, right? That's in, right, in the Hexa ride. The, the Hexa, Hexa ride, yes. And that's all about this as well, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, I mean, basically, you can yeah. live the crate scene now because that's <laughs> the latest. What a nightmare. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Have you guys heard any details about that? It's not, is it open to the public yet? I, I've i not heard anything. I've not heard anything. Or did I maybe see some... some? I'm trying to think if I saw screen... Oh, um, I've seen promotional pictures materials on from it. There are we'll definitely have promotion to, materials, but yeah. I don't know if it's open. I'm not oh, sure. I think, I think it might have been open, but because it's in not a very accessible area, not a lot of people could have went. Also with the COVID situation, I think a lot of people didn't travel to go do it. I, I'll have to ask um, Coffee. Coffee goes to all the events and maybe Emika. Emika, of course, is busy with her family right now. But Well, I, I think uh, I remember Emika tweeting that she wanted to go, but she didn't, she couldn't travel right now. So she yeah. wasn't able to go, But uh, which I took to mean that it was open, but not yet. Um, 
that no one no one in our side of the fandom or people who can speak english i mean um actually already went i'm not sure anyone did well hopefully we'll get some some insight into that Okay, so we've had the crate scene four times in the manga. <laughs> you also maintain a master post of Irwin <laughs> of Irwin appearances. And it's just okay. You're making me sound slightly obsessive here. Uh, you I, okay, let's let's just call it like it is, all right? We're both slightly obsessive about this. But I know when Irwin died, we were all devastated. We were talking to each other constantly that weekend mm, and yeah. the devastation and his character being over. And I remember us thinking at the time, we'll probably see him in flashback, that he is going to be important until Levi dies. But I don't think any of us had any idea. How many, How many? let's not even just say since he died. Let's go with since um, this arc began. How many appearances has Erwin made? So in in the final arc, he's appeared in 112, 125, 126, 130, 132, 135, 136. Since chapter 84, he has appeared as a visual. So there has been like a visual appearance from Erwin in 12 chapters mm. since chapter 80, since he died in chapter 84. There have been about another five or six where he has been mentioned by name or there has been some kind of allusion to him. And again, that um 2018 um Q&A session autograph Q&A session with Asayama he did actually mention in that that it was likely that we would see characters like Erwin and Bertold again possibly in flashback although funnily enough in the same Q&A session he also said that he found it difficult to draw Erwin in flashback so he's obviously been practicing <laughs> we not only have had the flashback, we've had that scene with him and Hanji's, you know, vision of the afterlife. So it's new content as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in fairness, I have to ask you both. We complained at the very start of this podcast about Isayama and repetition. <laughs> it's not complaining <laughs> per se. <laughs> yes, I was aware of that when I said that earlier on. <laughs> I would imagine people that don't like Erwin are just so, they probably feel like this. Yeah, like they probably I do. do feel the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And they, feel... to be honest, yeah, they could be forgiven for that. Yeah. But on the other hand, I want to present you with the fact that I feel the things that are most often repeated, whether it's killing Erin or Erin's appearances, are just much more important than the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to argue with that, really. It is. <laughs> That's how I choose to interpret it, at least. So a focus of this conversation, getting my head out of my Irwin gutter where it rests so much of the time, <laughs> is Levi acknowledging that he might not get to kill Zeke. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or it felt like that to me. It felt like that to you guys as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, it's maybe. Differing opinions. <laughs> I, it seems to me like he's considering the possibility it might not happen. And I know you guys, I, we will probably get into more about this later too. You guys hated Zeke as much as I did. Like you, we we were all <laughs> gunning for Levi to kill Zeke. Yes. You're so, putting this in the past tense here. I don't think you okay, need to okay. do that. <laughs> for me, maybe. Um, have you guys accepted that he might not kill Zeke? Does that work for you, Marie? Does that, I mean, if Levi ends up not being able to kill Zeke, does that, I mean, you okay with that? From a story perspective, I cannot really see that ending without like Eren and Zeke having something to do with each other. So from a, from a purely plot perspective, I was reading myself for that to be the case. But also I like the fact that Levi has persuaded himself that killing Zeke is something he needs to do uh, because it's one of Erwin's orders to fulfill. And I it feels to me like he thinks... Since it is an order, since it is part of his vow, it's almost as if is it if he doesn't take care of the beast titan, then maybe a rinse to charge wasn't necessary, or yeah. maybe it wasn't worth it. And I suppose he convinced himself so well that it was something he had to do. He never actually really paused to consider if it was for the better at that part. Because killing Zeke was relevant. Uh, when he was their enemy in return to Shigenshina. 
But, but actually, if I tried to cling more times than that, and he failed more times than that. So I guess for him, it really is revenge. It was revenge and it still is revenge. But I suppose he's starting to realize it might not be possible for him to take. I'm pretty sure he still wants to. Oh, yeah. I agree with you. Like, there's a huge amount of revenge in wanting to kill. It's not that, you know, when people make the argument that Levi's all about vengeance, that's not true. He's not. It's He's not all true. about humanity. But you cannot deny Levi's yeah, not there's, there's vengeful. There's certainly an element of, of revenge there. But, um, I mean, I think, and again, you know, sort of looking back over the years and a lot of the discussion and debate after Chapter 84 about where Levi would go from here, and, and particularly after the time, you know, after the time skip, uh, or or when we when we woke up and discovered we were in Marley, um, there was a lot of discussion about well, will Levi ever be able to kill Zeke? And at the time, I wrote a meta post, I think, saying it would not surprise me if the plot develops in such a way that humanity's survival depends on Zeke being sp- being kept alive, yes. and that Levi is not able to kill him for this reason, which of course is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, that's that's a counter argument to people who say that, you know, Levi is just driven by blind revenge, that he had plenty of opportunities to kill Zeke after Liberio and didn't. You know, he abided by orders, he kept him alive, he babysat him in the forest. Um, yeah. He had, there was plenty of times he could have killed him and he didn't until Levi just, decided he is the ultimate threat and I've got to take him out of the picture now and we know how that ended up. I, I've i always suspected that Levi will never be able to just kill Zeke outright in a fight or a battle, that it would be a, a, you know, a clean ending to that story. I've always thought there would be more to it than that. However, I think the fact that we did get this internal monologue that this did come up again suggests to me that there is still something in play here and that even if Levi can't fight, even if he has realised that maybe he will not be able to kill Zeke, I think there is some kind of unfinished business between them and I wonder if it will hinge on, or I suspect it will hinge on, what does Zeke decide to do from here on in? Another focus of Levi's monologue was something that we saw Hanji do, which was question whether or not any of the dead Survey Corps members would support the rumbling. Erwin is always the focus of those. And yet still, I think in the poll, 30% of the fandom thinks that people couldn't know. This is Levi's opinion. Erwin might support the rumbling, which I think is just, at this point, willful ignorance. Uh, Marie, maybe you could start. What did you... Think about that second half when he talks about the original Survey Corps charter and uh, that focus on what they devoted their lives to. Yeah, definitely. I really thought Levi's monologue, this chapter, really solidified the fact and would have been should have been enough to remove all doubt. So I really, I really don't understand how the question still is relevant in a way. I keep thinking that Erwin was ruthless, but it was not stupid. And he would have given his all to find a solution that did not include annihilating the entire world. Because as Levi says, if so, then what are they even fighting for? I'm not sure if it's not a single person, but it feels to me at this moment that not a single person except Aaron supports the rumbling. So I really struggle to understand why Erwin should have. I I absolutely agree. And... (laughs) You know, whenever this comes up, my you know my only response is like, how, how is this even a question? You know, how can you yeah. read the manga and just still even contemplate that any of the Survey Corps, never mind Erwin, would support the whole scale slaughter of humanity? Why do you think it's in the story again? Because we just had this with Jean and Hanji, and now we're having it again with Levi. And I would I would assume it's it was also touched on in Levi's flashback in one fourteen. Why why is the story revisiting this again? I suppose it does make clear in a way that 
none of the values that they fought for, the things they wanted to see up until then were the world in despair at no point. And it's in the way Levi says it as well, um, the fact that their dream was maybe a little bit naive. Like they wanted, they wanted something which was not at any cost. And I suppose people tend to also link it to Erwin because they do see him as doing anything that needs to be done, whatever the cost, which I think isn't true. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot has been made of the fact that, you know, Erwin was a, a ruthless military commander and 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 it's true he was as were several of the other military commanders we've seen in the series like Pixis, Magath but and Erwin was a gambler but he also had a degree of caution which you know one of the scenes that is quite often held up as an example of his ruthlessness is the the, the fight with Annie and Stohes and the mm-hmm. civilians that were killed then but um Allowing the Titan battle to spill out onto the streets was the very last option they had. It was like it wasn't even Plan B. It was about Plan D or E, I think. And the you know the first options didn't work. So that and and Erwin owned that. And similarly, when it came to the return to Shigonshana, he did sacrifice the lives of his soldiers, but he rode out at the head of them and he sacrificed his own life first. So it does seem astonishing to me that anyone could believe that he would be willing to sacrifice the whole of humanity for what and for what i mean that's that's the question that comes to my mind nobody is benefiting from this apart from merin it's a point isayama's trying to hammer home and he's having people that we trust say, or I've always trusted hanji mm. i've always trusted levi he's yeah. having people that we trust say it and i just i feel like Isayama keeps repeating that the characters that we love and trust or that we did in the beginning of this story would never do this. And while he may not be trying to be writing a moral novel or, you know, to to have any lasting, you know, be be very specific about the message he's trying to to have in this manga. He wants to leave it open for interpretation, or so he says. And yet, yeah, or so he know, says. Let's let's make it clear that none of these characters would be doing this. Would be none of these characters that we've respected would be yeah. re- would be doing this. I do feel that it's a little unnecessary to uh, go back to it again and again. But mm-hmm. at least I would have thought so if I had known um, the many different interpretations that stem yes. out of it, yeah. and which actually show that people will interpret it in a variety of ways, and. It might seem unnecessary, but personally, I quite like the reminder. I just wonder if he's aware of how people are interpreting things. And and that's why he takes the time to add things like this. I I don't don't know. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's just a checkbox on his actual storyboard. Like, let me make this point again. Let me make this point again. Let's make sure I'm crystal clear here. Because that's what this was. This was crystal. This was making things crystal clear. About Levi, certainly, mm-hmm. and it, it and it could be as well that given that you know because Hanji made the same points as well. I mean, they mm-hmm. they had a very similar, um, except in, in their case, it wasn't a an internal monologue. You know, they they laid it on the line with you know when they were talking. Uh, was it with the first scenes with the alliance or just before that? That no, Erwin would never have supported this. This is not what they were fighting for. Yeah, um, they need to work to save humanity, and you know. I love these scenes because they were so angry and adamant and really um, fired up. And of course, now that Hanji is gone and Levi is the only remaining member of the original Survey Corps or or the Survey Corps veterans, sorry, perhaps maybe that's why it was brought up again, that it's like, you know, that the last of the veterans is reiterating this point again. And that again, you know, he is that he is the legacy of the veterans of the Survey Corps. So the last panel of Levi's monologue is about Levi's choice. Erwin, I didn't pick you, and I have no regrets about that, entrusting the future to the kid who has the same look in his eyes as you. And 
I was a little worried when we got this chapter that it was going to be, you know, serum bowl 10.0, like we were just going to go digging up all those arguments again, but I didn't see that. I think people got it. Like, I I don't Mm -hmm. think this was about Armin's dream being more pure or, or Levi being disappointed in Irwin. It was none of those things. It literally was what we had been saying, you know, letting Erwin go. Erwin had fought hard enough, but here's this kid who is going to take us to, or is going to take mankind to the next level. Our mission ends here. This mission, this is the next mission, which again, Mm -hmm. it's a tired storyline, but it works for me here. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. And I think, I think by now we all understand the rationale behind Levi's choice. We understand why he chose to to let Erwin die in peace and not to drag him back to this hell. We understand that, you know, he admits that it was a personal choice on his part. Um, but we also understand that he he is passing the baton over to Armin. Um, and again, I think it just neatly clarified um, all these uh, different elements and just, you know, wrap them up neatly and, you know, just reiterated them again. Mm-hmm. I suppose we also see sort of an example of the benefit of hindsight, knowing what happens of the world afterwards. I remember at the time not thinking at all that Armin would be a better serum candidate in any case. And I know there is an aspect of, like, the plot demands it. So there is definitely that. But in hindsight, I suppose that letting Erwin rest was even more significant uh, with the benefit of hindsight that Isayama has and that we know we also have now of what is happening in the world. I'm very much more at peace with it now than I ever was before, I suppose. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And yeah, I really don't I really don't like usually this kind of storylines either where there is uh, a new generation to pass uh, I mean the hope of humanity to as you said Montaku is a bit tired I think. But the way the way Zama did this here while respecting characters this much and letting them stay true to themselves I suppose if you're going to have it, it's the best way to have it. I used to think that it didn't matter who who was up against Erwin on that roof. It could have been Sasha. It could have been Daz. It could have been anybody that he would have picked that person. But I think it being Armin, I, I guess I'm not so sure about that anymore. If it had been Daz, mm-hmm. if it had been Sasha, if it had been, you know, I think I think the fact that it was Armin just made it a lot easier because of that. I I guess for me, I never really understood what that talk of the sea meant to Levi or how he internalized it or how he interpreted it. I think because maybe for me, I had already heard that speech like 30 times and I didn't need to hear it again, but it was Levi's first time hearing it. And just that awareness that the world was much bigger than the, than their Island. And that, you know, I don't know, it, it, I this made me feel better about Serum Bowl, right? Like it, that was such a hard time for me, and yeah. I hated everything about it. And mm-hmm. really getting Levi's mindset, like I, I started agreeing with Levi within a few months. Like, yeah, he was right. Irwin needed to rest. This Irwin did not need to be alive for this absolute nightmare that followed the basement reveal. This is great. Irwin checked out. Good, good, good for my guy. But this this definitely helped me to look at it a little bit differently as well. Yeah, no, I thought I really liked your take on this in the that meta post that you wrote that you mentioned earlier on. That you know, reaching the 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 sea was the fulfilling of the Survey Corps' or, original mission. When Erwin spoke about freeing humanity, he, you know, he he did always have the supposition that there were people beyond beyond the walls. He did, of course, he, he was did. right. But even Erwin couldn't see beyond the bounds of the world that they believed they were on at the time. 
I think the thing about about this particular monologue was it, it gave the sea an extra significance in that it wasn't just Armin's dream. It was the boundary of the world as they knew it. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like the boundary of um, the original Survey Corps' mission. Yeah, I went back and read the Survey Corps charter because I wanted to be very clear on <laughs> of that. Course like, you what? Did. <laughs> of course I did. Because I and I like looking at those old posts anyway. But you know, the Survey Corps mission, what they were de- when they devoted their hearts, they were devoting it to a very specific thing. It was the reclamation of land that had been taken from the Titans, and it was exploration. You know, they were the scouts. They were not the Fix the they world. weren't the garrison. They, they weren't. They the, were. The, yeah, mm-hmm. they weren't the military police. And I think it's. I think it's. You know, it's very telling. The chap. The title of this chapter is very telling. So now I. I think even the fact that we're calling the new group the Alliance, they're not. The, I, in my head, they've been the Survey Corps, but they're not mm-hmm. really. They're, yeah, they're the Alliance. Yeah, it's the Alliance, and really, if we look at it, it's the warriors who are. Their, um, the key players in the sense that their yes. mission hasn't changed. The warriors are the ones that always wanted to get the founding Titan power away from Aaron. Yeah, that's to very stop. true. Yeah. So now like the Survey Corps has actually kind of gone more to the sides of the the remaining Survey Corps has gone more towards the side of the warriors. So mm-hmm. the Alliance being a neutral name. Of course, I can't separate it from the Wings of Freedom and that initial ideology, but I'm glad that it's a whole new group and not the Survey Corps doing this. And it's true that it's not the same purpose anymore. In fact, uh, by the f- natural things, it has become even not the opposite, because that's not true. But the survey corps has always been dedicated to exploring and reclaiming, but also the biggest force behind um, the preservation of Eren throughout the story. And of course, now the alliance goal is the complete opposite of that. Okay. One last topic. Are we done with um, Levi? I mean, we I could go on I'd, for hours, well, I suppose. I don't think we'll ever be done with Levi. <laughs> well, we get to bring Levi up again in a few minutes in the Armin and Zeke discussion. So, all right. So the chapter closed with, uh, we're back in paths where we expected to be with Armin and of course the reappearance of Zeke. And I am fine just kind of glossing over Armin's self-hatred here because yeah. I kind of saw it coming and it's very sad, but I, whatever it takes to get Armin to get over himself and start thinking about a plan is a very yeah. good thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do, you know, all those panels of him comparing himself to Erwin. I think, you know, this is the culmination of those as well, where he feels like the life he was given, his expectations, everything, all of it, he was not able to live up to any of it. I mean, w- one of the things I've always felt about Armin is that, and, you know, I've said before about, you know, I think Hisayama's real strength is in his ability to create compelling characters and characters that people invest in and I know that Armin has many many devoted fans but I think the the thing the problem I've always had is that we keep being told what a genius he is but we don't often get to see it that's very true and I you know I I I I actually genuinely hope that in these last three chapters we will finally get to see Armin putting his brain to work because we haven't had much opportunity to see that really. And we're now at what chapter 136 and there's three chapters to go. So I really hope that Armin finally gets the opportunity to come into his own because up until this point, we do keep getting told what a brilliant genius he is. It really feels like Armin got the best resume and then he got to the highest (laughs) position, but we've never actually, (laughs) yeah. We've never actually seen him like are for just you, results. Like we need to results at this point. Are you suggesting he faked a CV, Marie? <laughs> kind of. I mean, it's not. He didn't fake it himself. To be fair, uh, Mikasa and Aaron faked it for him. He faked his references. They he did faked his the references. references. He just had really yeah. good references. He did. He had very good references. <laughs> because I would be honestly, honestly, uh, I'm only asking. I'm only asking to believe that Armin is a genius. But like he has to, he has to show us at some point. Yeah, yeah. And I would be very happy to believe it. But I agree with you. Um, up until then, it's more things that we've been told rather than things we've noticed. It's time for Armin to earn his keep. 
Not that, and I, I say this, I know people, I love Armin. I love Armin. I know you're, I know you're a big fan. I'm a fan. So I am very excited to see what happens next. He's, that little brain is going to start working. Speaking of geniuses, the other people, the other person who gets credit for constantly being a genius is Zeke. So if that's, the, I don't even know where that came from. Like, I don't, I do not even know. Is there a character guidebook or something? I, that says that I think, I think the thing about Zeke is that he clearly thinks that he is a genius. And I, I actually, that is one thing about, I quite like about him. He's got <laughs> oh, this yeah. kind of incredible self-belief and you just think, where the hell did that come from? Um, but yeah, he's he believes in himself, or he used to. So is it a fanon? Is it fanon idea that he's eleven ten intelligence, or is that is there any canon proof that he's smart? Because again, he's one of those characters where I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know if it's fanon or canon, but he's always being brought up as like some four D chess player, and I've never seen it. No, but it does. He does recognize that Peek is extremely intelligent, so maybe in that sense. Maybe it's not so bad in the end. <laughs> so he recognizes talent in others. We can yeah. give him 11 of 10. He knew that Peek was uh, the boss. I love that. My my impression of Zeke is always been that he's not half as smart as he thinks he is. Mm. Uh, he clearly thinks that he's uh, very intelligent, but I'm not sure he actually is quite as bright as he thinks he is. I think maybe he does have his moments, um, but yeah, I'm not convinced. Well, I think what's encouraging here is we've learned in the paths, in the first set of the paths, paths chapters that, that Zeke has spent what feels like an eternity. I think his exact words were that he's learned a lot while he's here. So he had an eternity. He's been in paths for a very, very long time, according to himself, and has learned many things according to himself. So now here's our men. Zeke's got the knowledge. Armin's got the will, and I'm very excited to see what they're going to do, what they're going to come up with. The interesting thing is that Zeke has changed clothing yet again. He's not an old man anymore. His appearance is totally... So I was looking back at the old chapters. When he first sees Aaron in paths, he's an old man, but he's still topless. And then he has clothing when... The... I know y'all don't care about this because it's <laughs> Zeke. <laughs> Oh, so no. then he's a long-haired old man wearing clothing as they do the walk through memory lane. And then he gets back out of the memories into sand paths and is old man, no shirt again. And now he's young man, fully clothed, playing in the <laughs> sand, which is more oh, information God. than you care about. Yeah. Much but, more information. Yeah, really. I know. I'm sorry, this is a podcast and we have to cover this. But what's interesting <laughs> is that he's not wearing his glasses. And surely whatever mechanism is allowing him to have paths makeovers every couple of chapters would allow him to have glasses if he wanted them. So I have answered an ask on Tumblr about this and agreed with an Anon who wonders if this might be a change in ideology. Like, are we supposed to look at Zeke now back in his regular clothes, back in his regular personality, but minus Xaver's glasses, if that's an indication that maybe his ideologies have changed? Do you guys have anything? I mean, <laughs> oh. deafening silence. You go ahead, Marie, because I think I answered a similar ask, actually. Uh, I, I was just about to talk shit, actually, because I re <laughs> the only thing I noticed uh, was indeed that people were quite um, disappointed that seemingly path residents now do have clothing. But honestly, it does make me think a little bit, if the theory is correct or if there's anything there, it does make me think a little bit of uh, Mikasa removing the scarf, actually. I mean, it'll remain to be seen if that's the case, but I have to wonder if that's what this is. And if Zeke has a redemption arc, how would you guys feel? I have made peace, but I we have had some really fiery Zeke conversations. That's the thing with Zeke. I'm not sure he really needs so much of a redemption uh, in the sense that I do feel it was just another warrior doing what 
needed to be done, even though it was in a very dehumanizing way. And yet, as we've come to learn, it was not nearly as dehumanizing as what Eren was thinking in a way. So there is that. But I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I, I always feel I dislike all the parts of the story where I feel like the characters just needed to have a dumb talk with one another instead of blasting each other's <laughs> heads off. And in that sense, both Zeke and Eren have a lot of things to atone for, I suppose. I would forgive Zeke for thinking that his way was the best way, because I'm sure he did. But however, I think I will always resent him for the actions that resulted out of it. I'm I'm not sure he's not... Yeah, he's not necessarily worse than others. He also just happens to have killed my favorite character, but it's not necessarily worse. I I think he is worse than others because he's effective he was effectively advocating eugenics. And I think like genocide, eugenics is one of these things that is non-negotiably bad. There can never be a good result from eugenics. I know people argue that he, you know, he was trying to trying to free the Eldian people from the curse of the Titans or such like, but he was effectively um, removing any choice, any advocacy, any freedom of from what little freedom they ever had. Um, and uh, eugenics is always wrong. So I think in that respect, he 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 was worse than others. He's just not as bad as Eren. Yeah, that's that's my problem with it because I don't want. To- I mean, it's terrible that we have to have this conversation. Like, is genocide worse than eugenics? Like, exactly, it's a terrible exactly. conversation. To it's have. a race to the bottom. It really yeah, is. That's why I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I think. I think my feeling about Zeke is that Isayama has been very, very clever in the way that he's developed this character because he, you know, he set him up to be the villain, and then he pulled out all the stops to turn that around and to make Zeke or one of the most sympathetic characters in the story. He showed us this poor, you know, beautiful little child who had this utterly tragic childhood, who was abused by his parents or or exploited by his parents, certainly. Um, just, you know, had all these terrible things happen to him. And then, of course, ultimately, Eren betrays him as well. And, I mean, Isayama has been absolutely blatant about tugging at our heartstrings to make us feel sympathy for Zeke. And I think he's actually been very successful in doing that to the point that it is actually very easy to forget that he was advocating for eugenics, and it's actually quite a clever bit of story writing. And again, I think it does come down to this, you know, talent that Isayama has for creating complex characters and using these characters to really play with his reader's emotions. So on the one hand, I I actually appreciate Zeke as a character. I think he's a very complex and very interesting character. I do not like him at all. I don't feel a great deal of sympathy for him. And in terms of atonement or redemption, well, I wonder what it is that he's learned in paths. If he has learned that eugenics is wrong and that what he was advocating was wrong, then perhaps he does deserve some kind of redemption. But I think it is very much dependent on that. And I think the the really sort of pivotal point going forward is likely to be if if Armin can extract Zeke from whatever bind he is in, I think whatever happens next will hinge on what Grisha told Zeke when he told him that he loved him and to stop Eren. And I think mm. it is significant that in those scenes as well, he's again not wearing the glasses. Yeah, that's true. And it's definitely... I mean, I can't see any other way than him and Armin coming to some kind of conclusion, whether they agree with each other or not, because closing in on what's possibly the final fight, you cannot have such 
pivotal characters in Aaron's life not be there. So I would I would very much like to see what they have to say to each other. It's exciting. I I like I think I answered in an ask today. It's not that I I like Zeke anymore. I mean, I do like him. I I or it's not that I'm blind to who he is. He he to me was um very happy being a cult leader, having a godlike stat. Yeah. Like he seemed very comfortable in that role. He had a bit of Yelena, a messiah complex. Yeah. He did. It seemed very natural. And, yeah. Yeah. So it's nice seeing him cut down a peg. Here he is sitting in the sand like a child looking to spot. Like I I'm I like seeing him this way. Uh, what comes next, I'm interested in. And and I like what you said about it not necessarily being a redemption. It's kind of a character evolution for myself to go from resenting every moment this man was in the manga, hating every moment of it, to now suddenly be interested to see what he's going to say and what he's going to do. And in my perfect world, he'd still be a little bit villainous. Like I don't want him to be wholeheartedly helping the Survey Corps. I want him to, I want him to be more like a Kenny where he's going to cooperate oh. to where it benefits. Well, you, <laughs> you know mean, what I mean? You can never hold a candle to Kenny. Oh, shit. You meant- <laughs> No way. You meant a Celtic. I uh, meant. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny had I, all the charisma that Zeke can only dream about. I know, but Ze- but Kenny always still was never, I mean, Kenny o- also kind of clung to his own selfish motives, I think. Oh, absolutely. Get, absolutely. Right, no, so he did. He absolutely did. That's all I mean. I, want, I don't want Zeke to suddenly like wholeheartedly embrace the Survey Corps. I want him to, to cooperate with them as long as it's convenient and still works for his motives, but for him to still have his own motives. You don't want him to have a cowboy hat. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no cowboy hat. No, oh, no, no matter I'm what. I'm disappointed. He can take the shirt on. He can put the shirt off. Oh, just but... leave the shirt on, please. <laughs> <laughs> I feel there's a bit of a chaotic element in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which can I, I be mean, interesting. I... Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do, I do think that it that it will come back to you know Grisha encouraging or asking Zeke to stop Erin and I think that he may now see that as his main role um but if he does move to do that he will be doing that because of what Grisha wanted him to do and not because it's what the alliance want, if that yeah. makes sense. He'll still have his own motive. Yes, yeah, and I think his motive is to, you know, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's the daddy issues again, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were saying about Isayama pulling out all the stops to mm-hmm. humanize Zeke oh, and God, making yeah. him the family disappointment. Like, who cannot relate to being the family disappointment <laughs> and wanting your parents' love, and then. I don't know. It's like, yeah, he 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 just he cut low with that one. But. Uh, yeah, but I mean, did. you can you can be sympathetic to the person for what he has gone through and still absolutely condone all of his actions. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's what's really important with Zeke because absolutely his his um his parents exploited him, but at the same time he was responsible for betraying them to an absolutely horrific death. Or a horrific fate. I don't even um, blame him for that. That I blame on. No, Zaber. I do. <laughs> he was eight years old. Lost. I don't care. <laughs> he was a child. No, that was the grown ups, and that's the grown ups' fault. They should never have put that on him to betray his yeah, parents. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I was a trusted authority mm-hmm. figure telling him to do that, but he did plenty of other awful stuff. Yeah, he kind of earned his own lot, I suppose, as well. Like. It was not good to begin with, but then. I think one of the things that sets Zeke apart to some extent as well, and again, this even sets him apart from Erin, although Erin is, you know, willfully slaughtering people, I don't get the feeling that he's getting any enjoyment out of it. Whereas Zeke did seem to actively revel in killing people. And that that, that moment when he turns... Levi's comrades into Titan in the forest. Mm-hmm. He really did feel like he was enjoying it, and just all the all the moments with the wine turning them into Titans. I, I yeah, I'm pretty sure he did feel like he had such a big brain at that moment. Mm-hmm. 
his arrogance is on display. It was on display. That was his his Achilles heel. Was that arrogance, thinking he was smarter than or tougher than Levi, smarter than everybody? You know, he 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 did manage a few of his ploys, but for the most part, just that complete lack of repentance yeah, over yeah. everything. And it, and it wasn't just once; it was over and over again. Mm-hmm. It was the same with. Um, Connie's village and it was the same with the charge in Shigonshina and it was the same with when Mike was killed there there was an there was an active reveling in the cruelty and the killing which I think I mean there are very very few other characters that we have seen who really did seem to revel in death in that way and the only other one I can really think of is um uh Sergeant Gross I I put early Annie in that care in that group. I mean, we saw her squashing the bug, which is kind of one of those antisocial behaviors that. But the way she was swinging people, and you know, in the female Titan arc, just she when she was rampaging, it it looked like she was very proud of her abilities. At least, at a minimum, Annie was very proud of her physical abilities. That's true. That's true. But whether she reveled in right. The killing the same way? I, I don't know. I don't know. And I think Zeke fans would say that he never reveled in it. He turned it into a game as a coping Yes, mechanism. that's what I was oh. thinking. I've seen that <laughs> argument. Hmm. I don't yeah. I, I think that's a bit of a specious argument, to be honest. In Annie's case, I do buy that it was kind of a coping mechanism to focus on what she did well and, you know, enjoy the physical movements of her body and whatever. But with G, I never saw arrogance in Annie. I see a lot of arrogance in Zeke. And, well, I think um, I think if there was arrogance in Annie, it was a pride in her physical ability, and we saw that in her, you know, ability to fight and to, you know, to to beat Erin in hand to hand combat, you know, when there were cadets, and I think that carried through into her Titan form. Um, so I think, you know, if if there was arrogance there, it was with her own physical ability. I don't think it was an idea of superiority. I don't think Annie ever necessarily saw herself as being superior to anyone. That's a good point. That's exactly with uh, where Zeke differs. Maybe there was that sense of um, superiority for sure. Hmm. Good one. So, uh, Lost, you got an ask on Twitter from Levi Moonsky. Let me read that to you. It says, "Hey, dear Lost." Aw. After thinking it through and reading your post regarding Levi's death and future, I have one very simple question for the podcast. How would you feel if Levi kills Zeke without giving him a fight? How would he feel? We know he can no longer fight, and it's very likely that Zeke teams up with the Alliance, so he might be willing to die to stop the rumbling. I'd like to hear your opinion on this. I know that you'll do a great analysis out of it. Thank you, (laughs) and have a nice day. No pressure then. <laughs> I think that may be related to some meta I wrote again in response to another question about, you know, what did I think would happen to, to Levi? And I guess I do wonder if, you know, going back to what I was saying about um, Grisha asking or exhorting Zeke to stop Erin, I do wonder if, if Zeke is still the link that enables Erin to control the wall titans and that the way to stop the rumbling is for Zeke to die I wonder would he actually willingly sacrifice his own life to stop Erin and would that be some kind of resolution to his relationship with his father that he sacrifices himself to save the world Um, if that was the case then where does that leave Levi and his vow Levi doesn't seem to be willing, seem to be able to to fight the way he used to. Is there a possibility that he could that Zeke would allow him to kill him? I don't know. That would certainly be one way out. I do still think that Levi's vow and his relationship to Zeke is not over. I do find it quite difficult to say how that will play out, but I I, I think there is more to their story yet. I don't think that Levi will kill Zeke in a fight at this stage because I don't think Levi can fight and I'm not sure that Zeke would be willing to or able to himself because it's still a moot point as to whether Zeke really has any free will at this stage and if Armin will be able to get him out of paths or um, 
you know, free him from whatever bind he's in. Um, so, but it is, I guess, possible that they could work together in some way. I think if Zeke was to die by somebody else's hand or through some other means, his own sacrifice, I think Levi would just be glad that he was gone, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm not so sure that Levi needs to be the person to know to kill Zeke as much as he needs to know that Zeke is no longer a threat to anyone. Exa- exactly, exactly. I think I think Levi would just be relieved either way. Um, but I, yeah, I do think there is still there is more to their story. I hope so. I really did enjoy them uh, their conversation style together. Like it was some of the most entertaining dialogue. What Levi and Zeke? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fun to write as well. <laughs> Zeke is still pretty terrified of Levi, whatever the state is in, which I understand, yeah. Ideally, if they died, if they could still communicate somehow, where let's just say either of them does have to take the the decision to, to allow their own deaths for whatever reason, for them to be sniping at each other as they're doing it would be lovely. I mean, I could, I could see an event that takes both of them, definitely. If they have to explode something together, one, two, three, go. They don't. They don't necessarily have to uh, be inclined to work together. I guess, like, it doesn't have to be a condition. But I suppose something that happens to the one will make something happen for the other in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we wouldn't be insisting so much on their unfinished business, otherwise. Yeah, they're they're bound together for for better or for worse in terms of plot dynamics. Levi and Zeke have got this thread connecting them and Isayama has purposefully drawn attention to that thread again. Um, so I think it it is it is something is bound to happen between them. Well, Armin has this new ability where he can see what's happening outside of the paths realm. I, I think my question right now is can Armin leave this paths realm or is he gonna communicate from there? Like I have no idea what the dynamics are going to be now moving forward if the characters will come into paths like if if Armin yeah. he can see them can he talk to them will they join him in paths is is there going to be kind of like this fluid thing of characters coming and going as he as he sends messages back and forth i have this really dumb crack theory that i i posted it to tumblr a little while ago that Armin now knows that Emir can resurrect the dead titans, that everyone's connected via paths, that death is not the end of that connection since she's able to pull people from history. And so my new crack theory that I will be holding <laughs> on to is that Armin and Zeke can somehow bring back all the dead survey corps. I knew you were going to go say that. Fight. Yes. <laughs> this is a Lord of the Rings ending, isn't it? <laughs> it's a Return of the King ending. <laughs> It's never going to happen. Oh, that would be terrible in a way. You know that it it would be be. terrible. It would be because when Paths dies, they would die too. They would be, they're echoes, right? They they would disappear as well. But Levi getting to fight with the Survey Corps again and all of them dying at the end. And let's see, today is January 14th. I get to play with this idea now for what, 15, 16, 17 more days. So let me have it. If it doesn't happen, I'll write it for you. <laughs> Thank you. While you're at it, Christina, please consider the fact that if your theory is true, and at the end they've got to annihilate the power of the Titans, it means that everyone got to enjoy the afterlife save for Levi. We will never exactly. see Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is my whole thing. Like this would be so tragic. It would be great to see them all together, but then when they die. It seems very really plausible. Oh, let me, I've got, I've got like three weeks to enjoy it and to, <laughs> and it's not a good thing. I see it as something like heartbreaking to have them come back and then to die. But the chapter ends with Zeke mentioning, so Ymir ate you too, which uh, I guess that's what we were supposed to be pondering on for mm-hmm. the next three weeks. What did Zeke mean that he was eaten as well? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Cause I do. It was a very abrupt ending, wasn't it? And I, I know mm. that you got several asks, and I, I, I might have got one as well. I can't remember about was that really the end of the chapter, or was something <laughs> missing? And it was quite an odd ending. And you, I'm not entirely sure what it meant, but but you do, you do have to wonder the the status of 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 whether Zeke is actually alive 
mm-hmm. is been something that's I've been curious for a while because um, when he was resurrected from that weird Titan womb, it did seem that he had actually been properly dead at that point. And you could say he was properly eaten at that point. He was exactly, in yes. The Titan yeah. stomach. Yeah, because I'd always kind of felt that almost like Levi did fulfill his vow at that point. He did actually mm-hmm. manage to kill Zeke. It's just Ymir brought him back. That's true. I think it's absolutely up to debate as to is Zeke alive in any mortal sense? Is his existence tied to any kind of physical body? Does he have any free will? Is he able to leave paths? These are all questions that I think are moot points at the moment and that I don't think we have answers to. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. So the prevailing theories, this is, you guys probably don't know this yet because you don't hang out with the plot chads like I do. But some of the plot chads are saying that there's two instances of Zeke. One that was eaten and then like maybe back in chapter 114 when he was pushed into the Titan's stomach, that that's when he was mm-hmm. eaten by Emir. And there's been, I, I'm not actually sure how the theories go, but the two, there's a two Zeke theory going around now, which I don't put a lot of credence into it, although it is fun. I like, I love fun theories. And then the other idea is that Zeke was eaten off screen and we just haven't seen it yet. That just as if, just as uh, Emir sent a Titan mm-hmm. to consume Armin, she sent one to consume Zeke. So I really like the idea that he was eaten in 114 and at that point yeah, kind of has that's... been controlled by, or not controlled by her, but at that point he has been doing her bidding as much as his own or she's had some influence there that maybe she didn't have before. Yeah, that's, uh, like that's you said, feasible to me. We got no idea at this point. It's it's fun to speculate. So I think that I think that finishes our manga discussion, or at least as much as we're going to cover. What would you guys like to see next chapter? Oh, um, I think I would like to see some clarification of the paths shenanigans and to find out more about. if Armin is going to be able to communicate with Zeke or to work with Zeke in any kind of way to find out if they have any kind of agency in paths. So yeah, paths dynamics is one of the things that I would like to see in the next chapter and also more peak would be nice. <laughs> Always a good suggestion. Yes. Yeah. I have I have quite a bit of a more extensive list. I, I suppose I suppose it's be, it's because there are so few chapters left, so we have to pack them with all we can. Uh, definitely, Zeke and Armin arriving to some sort of a conclusion, like maybe a course of action to follow if they can, because I guess not having them in the final fight seems too easy. They've got to be there somehow, and to be yeah decisive in some way, I guess. Also, I'd like to see some kind of answers as to Eren and OJ Ymir's plan. Like, not that I have any doubts about what they're trying to achieve here, but they seem to be very passive and almost erased in that sense, since it's all the Titans and it's the rambling itself that's doing all the heavy lifting at this point. I would love to have insight into what they're actually thinking. And I suppose, since it came up, um, Levi trying, or maybe not trying, but maybe trying to kill Zeke and also maybe dying himself, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, I suppose I would like to see that. So I would like to know, there's three chapters left. Which characters are you expecting to make an exit in the next three? Oh, not Levi for sure. Jean is going. Mm, I think I'm Jean might sure. survive. No, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to let him survive. I mean, all the all the Titan shifters, if they're not free from the curse, only have a maximum of thirteen years or so. So maybe not them to begin with. <laughs> I would hope that Pick doesn't die, but also I'm pretty sure. Like, I I've got a feeling that someone in the main trio between. Eren, Mikasa, and Armin is not going to make it. And my guess would be Eren. Though who knows? 
Yeah, I think Erin's a tricky one because this has all got to loop back round to the to chapter one some way. And Erin and Mikas are alive in that chapter, so how that all fits together, I don't know. But yeah, I think, you know, the Titan Shifters, their days are numbered. I think Jean might survive. Um, Connie... Ooh, I forgot I he was there. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> Connie. Connie has a remarkable ability to survive. He's doing really well. The one episode where we almost get through without a Connie bash statement, and you guys. I'm so sorry. It's, it's okay. Just, it's okay. It there had are so to many characters that I really do not care about. <laughs> had to happen. Oh dear. Um, I think Falco will die. I think Gabby will live. Historia will live. I would love to see Peak live, but I don't know if she will. I think, I think Yelena might live, actually. I do too. What she seems Ryder? to have remarkable staying power. What about Reiner? No. I think oh. Reiner is, I think Reiner is going to have his Helos moment. I know some people think he's already had it, but I think there's going to be more to mm. it. And I think it's awfully convenient that there is a titan there that has a trident. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if there, if Reiner will still get his Helos moment in some way, shape or form. I think Kiyomi will live. That's not so many people. No, not that many. So you, so, so you guys don't think there's going to be an end, everyone dies ending, obviously. You, you oh, think no. there's going to be the more oh, optimistic no. ending. Yeah. It's not, it's not that. No, it's I wouldn't say that, it's optimistic. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the state of the world, it's even worse to be living maybe. So, so yeah, there will definitely be people to witness that. So you both think Levi's a goner. Oh yeah. Yes. Okay. And Aaron, maybe, likely. I'm well, betting on it and yeah. lost is not, I suppose. Mm. But we can, that's nice. We can have something to bet on. <laughs> <laughs> mm. What are we going to bet? <laughs> I don't know. Let's take that offline. <laughs> <laughs> well, my list is Aaron, Armin, Levi, and Peak die. So those are my, I don't think three chapters is a lot of time to be killing people. So I'm keeping it short. I don't think Armin, I think Armin, oh, and Zeke, I think Zeke is going to die too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's, that would be a sensible, I mean, I can see that. I can see that happening. And the only reason I have Peak in that list and Zeke, especially are because no one over the age of 24 is allowed to survive. <laughs> that's apparently. true. Yeah. They're near yeah. their, yeah, they're past their expiration date it's very soon. Shonen manga rules is that they yeah. must die. Yeah. I mean, Levi is extremely overdue. <laughs> He really is. He's done well to survive this long. Amazing. Okay. We do have a few questions from our listeners. One is kind of a long theory. So I let tell you, let's go with the short one first. Uh, Kaylee SNK asked, with Isayama's most recent interview saying something like, we are just getting started for the final chapter, don't you think he was hinting for the time loop theory as an ending? Now, I did see lots of people talking about this. The uh, question specifically that was apparently asked was, have you decided that the ending would be unpredictable? And Isayama's answer was, it's just the beginning, which when I saw that, my blood went cold and I thought, oh God, love, love. But I went to our friend Emika, who's a translator, and she and I, I would say she spent maybe 20 minutes. She's in Japan, active in the fandom, a translator. She went through the July interview, the more recent interview, the email interview. She could find no evidence of that question. What she did find is a very similar question that was translated by, I'm going to mess this up, but is it Kasumi Kasa? I know I follow them on Twitter. They're another translator in Japan. The question that was actually asked was, have you decided on the ending which you have said it could not be predicted? And Isayama replied, we'll see. So I really feel like Kaylee underscore SNK from Twitter that this is one of those cases where we might be dealing with a bad translation. Now, if that's not correct, if somebody's got like evidence of this translation or even the original Japanese, please send it to us via Twitter, and we will take a look at that. 
So the last thing I have is a theory from Vital on Discord. It's a theory about the possibility of Falco becoming the next attack and founding shifter. And this is based partially on details that he saw online, but then his own as well. So he starts out by talking about the parallels between Aaron and Falco, which I think we've spoken about before. They both have visions of the future. Falco has that memory where he recalls flying in the sky, which now turns out to be true. But what's confusing about the theory is that neither Aaron nor Falco had the attack Titan when they had those future visions. We know that being able to see the future is a feature of the attack Titan, but neither of them had it at that moment. So this could mean that either Emir has been sending them the visions being paths. Remember, Emir stated, Aaron stated that Ymir led him there. Or it could have been Aaron himself in his time in paths speaking to Falco. We must take into account that when Aaron touched Historia's hand, he saw future vision from the next three years. He must have known that Falco was special and involved. Okay, maybe. I, I, I also really love the theory that Zeke is the one communicating with Falco, not Aaron. So Vital goes on to say that he believes that Aaron had specifically planned to keep Falco present during the reunion between Reiner and Aaron. One could say it so Falco would not inform the other warriors, but I think it's deeper than that. I think Aaron wanted Falco to listen to the conversation and remember it. The main point that Aaron wanted to drive into Reiner and Falco is that both sides are at fault and innocent at the same time. There is no point of continuing the cycle of hate and revenge since it causes generational pain but we must recognize that in the end, they are the same, victims of a cycle. So, assuming the Aaron-Falco theory is right, Aaron needed Falco to learn these lessons because since Aaron knew the future, he knew that Falco would eventually consume him, gain the attack titan, but more importantly, the founder. Falco, being a sympathetic, pure child, would not be corrupted by the power nor be chained to the vow since he's not of royal blood either. He's the perfect candidate to use the founding titan power for good alongside the advice of Armin and others. Together, they would figure out a resolution to stop the rumbling, remove Ymir's curse, and turn the pure Titans back into humans. Okay. That being said, I have saved the greatest piece of evidence for the last. So the parasite that attached itself to Ymir's spine is now living in Aaron's body. That parasite is a centipede, which is a worm, right? What are worms' biggest predators? Birds. I rest my case. I love that theory. I love that theory. <laughs> the bit about the birds, I mean. <laughs> yes, the last part. I So basically the theory is that Aaron is the one communicating with Falco. Aaron is trying to stop this. Aaron knows that Falco is the one to stop this. I think no. that's a little too much credit to be giving Aaron. I guess that's a lot of assumptions to be put onto both of them at this moment. Like it could end up in something like that, but I already... Don't see it happening this way. Yeah, why would Aaron, you know, try to manipulate Falco to stop something that he himself is doing? And I mean, it, it speaks to the fact that if Aaron's not in control, or if if Aaron, if or maybe this is part of Aaron's plan. Maybe Aaron is in control and knows that this is the path that has to happen. It seems a bit convoluted to go to a single point, which is stopping the rumbling and stopping the Titan curse. But Vital knows the way to my heart, and bird theory is it. <laughs> I do like the bird theory. I absolutely love the bird theory. That's very good, because these damn birds have got to mean something. They've got to. You mean besides the point that Falco's name is literally Falco, <laughs> right? <laughs> Genius. Do you guys think somebody communicated with Falco to give him the information that he could become a bird titan, that vision that he had? Um, besides Zayama, I would no. say... No. <laughs> Decides with Sayama. <laughs> yeah, Sayama communicates with him. Yeah, I thought it was clever of Sayama's part, but I don't know. No, I think. I mean, there's all there's all kinds of magical stuff happens with the Titan shifters that has never been explained down to the final point. So, I don't feel that it's necessary for somebody to have communicated that to Falco. Well, I'm going to be the standout here and say that I want it to be Zeke to have communicated with Falco. Okay. So, because would, we know now that they can yeah. see outside and Zeke has, uh, uh, Falco has Zeke's spinal fluid. And I would really love that to be 
Zeke doing something rather than building sandcastles. But if it is Aaron, if this is if Aaron is the 4D chess master and has known from the beginning that Falco would be the one consuming his power, then Vital, you will have an apology from me in about three chapters. <laughs> well, the thing is, whatever communication is happening, I would very much like everyone to have it in the pages. Yes. <laughs> mm. Actually see it happening? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Mm-hmm. But you know, with this, how Esayama is, it'll be 87 chapters later that we see it happen. So. <laughs> but we only have three chapters left, so that's not going to work anymore. <laughs> All that's left is our quick fire round, and we've invited our friend Polka back to do it in person. Polka, meet Lost and Marie, my guests for the 136 podcast, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, good evening, Bollywood. I mean, it's evening for me. It's quite late night for me, actually. And uh, yeah, so I, I get to do the quick fire round. So basically for the first few, this is going to be the current chapter stuff. Uh, it's going to be get two characters and you just pick one, whether you like them more, you like their character more or whatever. So for our starting uh, starting couple, uh, Gabby or Annie? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marie, come on. <laughs> Neither. Come on. I really don't care about either of them. You can pick any criteria you want. Best hair, best okay, fashion okay. sense. Okay, okay, Gabby. And for me, Gabby. Yeah, Gabby as well. She has like an actual character as well. So. I mean, yeah, there's that. It's not, it's not, it's not just Mrs. Keki and emo mode. Uh, Mikasa or Levi? Levi. 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 Yelena or Kiyomi? Yelena. Kiyomi. Yelena. Oh. Yelena. Armin or Zeke? Holy shit. Neither. <laughs> and neither. Got, I've talked to you guys about this. Neither Come is on. not an option. Come on. Armin or Zeke, you can do this. Okay, Zeke. Armin. Armin. Zeke Jaeger did nothing wrong. <laughs> you keep telling yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> Rico or Connie, and there's a stipulation here. Oh wow! Who's oh. who? Yes, yeah, this is this is a, a fun bit. The quick fire round. Who's more relevant? Oh. Rico or Connie? Rico's awesome. Rico. Rico. Is that even a question? <laughs> Rico. Yeah, Rico too. <laughs> She's actually probably doing something useful, like paper Love Rico. back in uh, back in Shiganshina or something. Definitely best haircut as well. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and best fashion sense as well. Yeah, that that's amazing how like he carries such a unique character, like uses up like two episodes or like two things, and it just just dropped her completely. It's weird. I have I have hope for Rico in the conclusion. Maybe Somebody's she'll on come paradise, back. Mm. slapping things in order, getting rid of those Jaegerists. Yeah, okay. Jean or Pick? Pick. 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 Jean. Falco or Reiner? Reiner. 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 Yeah, it's got to be Reiner, isn't it? Annie's father or Reiner's mother? Annie's father. Annie's father. Definitely Annie's father. Yeah, Annie's father. Which, what do you mean? Did, did uh, Reiner's mother's late turnaround not convince you that she's just a oh, person? Uh, <laughs> she's not won my heart over. Two pages of just saying, oh no, what a shame. It Ugh. doesn't win you over. So shocking, I know. I know. Truly the height of literature. <laughs> right, so this is what, what's cooler, the Archer Titan or the Flying Titan? Uh, Archer Titan, yeah. Archer Titan. Ah, uh, Flying Titan. That's got to be the Archer Titan, you know, English Longbowman and all that. <laughs> I mean, it's very classy. It's very it's classy. Yeah. Yeah, they look great. They look like um, the bloody elves from Lord of the Rings. Far That's me. true. But they have the aim of a stormtrooper, so Flying that Titan. That is true. <laughs> Flying Titan outmaneuvered them. 
no, no, there were several main characters on the bird, and so the, the, the shots deflected off and killed random nobodies, like in every single okay. battle in uh, Attack on Titan. <laughs> Don't you know that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's how it works at Attack on Titan. If you have, like, <laughs> a, if you've got, you know, two names and people give a shit about you, you know, sorry, buddy, but you're, you're, all your friends are going to die. Maybe Connie was up there using his, um, you know, blades to, like, knock arrows out of the way we never know the condi might have been no, like it's because it, it had a chance of killing rhino and everyone knows that rhino can't die <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, speaking of rhino what is the biggest titan shifter ass pull in the entire uh, so far the px rocket launcher detitaning or rhino's transfer of the brain to the nervous system oh rhino for sure oh definitely rhino yeah yeah rhino yeah Really? Damn. Mm. I, I guess PX Rocket Launch was the first one I experienced like in manga, so it doesn't feel really? as bad. Really? Oh, wow. No, that was cool. Right, so out, out of the four, which one would you would you pick? Mikasa killing Eren, Eren surviving, Reiner killing Eren, or Gabby killing Eren? Oh, Mikasa killing Eren. It's spicy. I'd be quite happy to have anyone kill him, to be honest. But yeah, it'd be quite nice to see Mikasa kill him. So I'm torn between Reiner and Gabby. Yeah, I'm gonna Reiner go... would be good too, <laughs> has to be said. Yeah. I, I just think Gabby killing Aaron would throw the fandom into <laughs> flames. But I yeah. And I would enjoy that for two seconds. I'm going to go with Reiner killing Aaron, which I would like more than anything. Yeah, Reiner Helios sending people. Mm-hmm. It's true. Yeah, I mean, Gabby killing Aaron would be hilarious, but... Not worth it. Not worth it. I have to live in this fandom. It's like setting my own house on fire. They're all funny, if you think about it. They are. They are. (laughs) Right. uh, This is a bit of a different question, but uh, I thought I'd introduce it just because I found it quite interesting. Uh, The manga has now run past what I thought it would run to, which I thought it would run to 134, but now it's run to 135, obviously. By... What chapter did you think the story would end 20 chapters ago? So would that be 114? And were you right? Oh, not are you right? But, you know, did you predict it to be longer? Or, and if not, how far off were you? I just made an absolute mess of that, but I hope you understand what I mean. Honestly, um, I don't know if I can answer that quickly. I mean, I never I never really posed to consider how many chapters there were uh, left to be. I never really asked myself. I really thought it was going to be in, over in October of this year. So I would say back then, I was definitely thinking a mid-2020 ending. So, But I've always thought it was ending before it was ending. Yeah, I can't say that I've ever paid much attention to chapter count. I think I've thought of it more in terms of like the, the story dynamics and the plot arcs, but I haven't really counted chapters. Okay, yeah, because I thought it would end about one thirty four from so so like in one fourteen. This is what coming around the Zeke dying sort of area. I thought it would be finished in twenty chapters. That's quite close. I mean, he keeps adding new shit to it as well, which I get really annoyed by. But it's like I'm just decides that he's going to add a new plot line, which is fun. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. Quest. One twenty six. Yeah, true. Back to the quick fire, you know, the fun bit of the podcast instead of me having a stroke trying to read something. <laughs> right, this is the... Okay, we've gone past the current chapter stuff because we've run out of characters. Sadly, there are not many surviving characters in the manga. So here is the dead people quick fire round. Uh, this will be begun by Margath versus Shadis. Shadis, just to pick one, but... Shadis. <laughs> Shadis. Yeah, Shadis. All right, so the two sort of king characters now, Willy or Rod Rice? Willy. 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 I do love Willy. Can we just have an aside of how handsome he is in the anime? That's all we He's have to say. He's got a great voice actor as well. Amazing. I mean, the design is not bad. It's better than Rod, that's for sure. <laughs> Erwin or Hanji? Erwin. 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 Oh, and damn, you guys are quick on that one. That was not even a hesitation. That's brutal. <laughs> there was no thought. You have you have the disadvantage of not knowing who these two are. Is this the Owen oh, Levi Ship fan club? Am I just stepped you into did. 
or something. Oh god, okay. <laughs> Petra or Moblet? Moblet. Moblet. Yeah, I think Moblet. I mean, he actually did something, so Moblet. Uh, Udo versus Sophia. Who? <laughs> Didn't you watch the anime? They're, they're literally in it. <laughs> like, literally, I have no idea who those are. <laughs> Sophia. Udo. And the anime won me over with him, although I love Sophia's sass. I pick Annie 2.0 and no other character traits. And then the last one, I kind of just threw the random characters together because the last thing I could think of. Berto or Kenny? Kenny. Kenny. <laughs> Kenny. Berto, Jesus Christ. This is Nobody's going to win against Kenny. I, mean, I come like on. Berto. I like Kenny Berto. Wins. Fuck you. It's normally there's like a fight or something, but you guys were just the same person, apparently. Just together. <laughs> I mean, just we, we are countries. friends. <laughs> we are friends. We do have good taste as well, so there's that. And we're, and we're always right, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's very true. Meet Peak and Other Peak. <laughs> <laughs> Polka, thank you so much once again for providing us with a quick fire. And that brings our 136 podcast to a close. I'd like to thank our guests, Lost Marie. I have waited two years to have you as guests. I am so grateful for you joining me now. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank our Patreons. I'd like to thank Kenny Hughes, Taryn, Simon Cox, Anne M, Silarana, Demonic Jesus, also known as Tom, Ruby Gus, Zero Vitz, who's brand new. Thank you so much for supporting us. And okay, guys, I don't even know how to say this, except that we had a new Patreon join us about a month ago. And this was like the ultimate power move. Uh, he's known as Swedish Chef on Discord, but he signed up for Patreon as... Aaron did nothing wrong. So I would like to thank Aaron did nothing wrong. There you go. I said it. (laughs) For supporting us. Yeah, I know. I know. He he really just paid you money to say that. You know that, right? He did. No lie. When, when, When this one popped up as Aaron did nothing wrong, I cried. I laughed so hard because this was such a power move. And I really do appreciate the support. Even if you chose a username that just makes me want to go downstairs and bathe myself as soon as I finish this podcast. (laughs) Well, anyway. (laughs) Um, (laughs) We'd also like to thank our listeners. And if you'd like to support the podcast, we always appreciate getting comments. If you would like to um, give us episode feedback, you can do that on our website. We do appreciate the comments. I guess all that's left is our closing catchphrase. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. Thank you for offering your hearts and your ears and see you next time. Bye. 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 Say bye, Polka. Bye. All right, uh, let me just send Polka a quick message. Did you want to hop on? Did we want to discuss anything else? Because I can always weave it in. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Did we cover everything? That was a pretty thorough review yeah. of uh, <laughs> at least the things that we cared about, <laughs> yes. I guess. I mean, unless you want us to talk about Erwin a bit more, we can always do that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>